Okay, it is nine o'clock. We will call to order the February 23rd, 2023 meeting of the Golden Rain Foundation Board of Directors. Deborah, roll call. Certainly, Walker. Here. Himaji. Here. Ali. Here. Hurt. Here. Bentley. Here. Flaherty. Here. Lee is excused. Meehan. Here. Topper. Here. And Matheson. Here. Here. You can tell Jeff is new. <laughs> it's only his second meeting here. Uh, a copy <laughs> a copy of the January 26, 2023 board minutes are in the agenda packet. Are there any corrections or revisions to those minutes? Uh, seeing none, they are approved as submitted. Deborah, thank you very much. And next up, we're always pleased to have City of Walnut Creek have a city council member come and attend our meetings and uh, welcome to Cindy Darling this morning. Thank you, and thank you guys all for inviting us all the time. We're glad to work in partnership with you. Um, yesterday, the city um, celebrated the State of the City Address by our mayor with the Chamber of Commerce folks out at Boundary Oak, and the message that we heard from the mayor yesterday really was a um, tinge of relief. We have um, rescinded all the COVID emergency orders, which was kind of a milestone. And I think we all need to congratulate ourselves on surviving what we will all be telling our grandchildren about. Um, we also talked briefly yesterday about the state of the city's economic health. And we made it through the COVID emergency, even though we had a $22 million drop in budget in 2020. We made it through without having to tap into any of our reserves. We had planned on doing that, but we did not end up doing that, thanks in part to the city really cutting back, and um, thanks in part also to all the people that went out and remodeled their house in the middle of the pandemic and kept our sales tax up. Um, so since this is an odd year, this is the start of our two-year budget cycle, and that two-year budget cycle kicks off with a priority setting by the council. We're going to be meeting on the 28th to, re to look at our five priorities and decide how we want to readjust those priorities. Um, that will guide our budget for the next two years. It'll also begin to guide how we appropriate Measure O dollars. As you remember, that was the sales tax that was passed in the last election. It will start to be collected in April. And as those, as those sales tax revenues come in, we'll have a better idea, but we anticipate about $12.5 million a year coming from that. And so that will be a 10-year budget item. And so we're working on how we incorporate that into our planning process. Um, I wanted to go over our current priorities and give you an opportunity if you want to reach out to me later and, and let me know if there's something else that you'd like to see in there because we are meeting next week early. Uh, the first one is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is the idea that we need to build a community that's welcoming and inclusive for everybody. We've made significant progress on this with training for our law enforcement officers and our entire city staff. Uh, we're reviewing our policies and practices, uh, but we have a task force on DEI that is still working and will hopefully come out with some recommendations in April on other things that the city could be doing. Um, our next priority is the economic development and COVID recovery. Um, COVID recovery, we have moved out of the, oh my God, the sky is falling mode and into taking those things that we learned in COVID that worked well and moving them forward. Uh, we did vote to continue outdoor dining downtown. Unfortunately, East Bay Mud and Contra Costa, our Central Sand, decided to tear up all of Locust Street, so all of those had to come down during the tear up. But we have um, standards in place now. So if a restaurant wants to build a facility for people to dine safely out on the, the sidewalk or the street, um, they are welcome to put those facilities together, and those are looked at as longer term. They're not just a temporary thing. Um, the other thing that we did in COVID recovery and economic development is we looked at how our economy is working. And we have a retail study that shows that retail, from a retail perspective, Walnut Creek is in a good place. We have the kind of downtown people are looking for. I think our consultant said it's the kind of place where it's like a little Easter egg hunt. People can go and they look for one thing and then they're reminded, oh yeah, they also wanted to get a pair of shoes. Um, the office picture, the office space picture is a little bit more confused. Nobody really knows what's going to happen with um, people going back into the office. 
The one bright spot for us is that we have the new cancer centers opening both at Bass Medical and at John Muir. And those are anticipated. I mean, they're a great resource for our community, and I'm glad to see them. They will also attract a lot of other medical office building uses, especially out of the Shadelands. And that's an area that historically was struggling with a high vacancy rate. Um, So we're looking to build that. Um, infrastructure out there and then keep an eye on how people are coming back into the office. Um, The next goal is environmental sustainability and climate action and this is one that includes the idea of being resilient to the things that we're likely to see with climate change Um, as witnessed by today's weather and the winter storms this year. Climate change is going to be a bunch of different things. It's going to be fire, it's going to be flood, it's going to be you know Chicken Little running around. Oh my God. Um, So we have a climate action plan, an update of our climate action plan coming to us this spring. We have not been resting on our laurels. We did just recently buy hybrid police vehicles. We have an all electric vehicle coming for our parking crew and a number of other things like that. Um, But we're looking for that sustainability action plan this spring to really guide us as we go forward. Um, Infrastructure and facilities. This is something that we have been working on forever. And the idea is that all of our infrastructure was built in the 50s and 60s, and things that were built in the 50s and 60s are starting to fall apart, myself included. And um, so we looked at the first um, conceptual plan for the new community center and the new um, swimming pool at Heather Farm. We saw that at the last council meeting. It looked really good. Um, It had a lot of great features to it. And the most reassuring thing is the architect that did that conceptual plan said we can fit everything in that space there. Uh, One of the questions that came to the council with that is should they build the community center to the building standard that's required for it to be an emergency uh, building? Right now, City Hall does not meet those standards. And so if we had an earthquake, uh, we are looking very strongly at building that new community Hello. center. Hello. Yes. Not your time yet. <laughs> at 10 o'clock, you have, can I? Um, anyway, so we're looking at building the community center both um, to make it more sustainable, make it meet the lead um, gold standard, but also to make it something so that if we have an earthquake, we have a facility that we can respond to an emergency from that. Um, And then social wellness and public safety. This is something that uh, we have put a lot of time and energy into. Uh, We did not only brought brought on the five extra police officers after the the Nordstrom smash and grab, but we've also worked to build our mental health capacity, both within the police force and with the county. The county has the new A3 program, which is a mental health response program that is available to everybody having a mental health crisis and will bring um, clinicians to help you and will help you find the resources that you need. Um, so we these are the policies that we have laid out right now. Some of the areas that I'm thinking we need to spend a little bit more time on include traffic safety. Um, we have noticed that after COVID, everybody drives a little bit wacky. And um, it's and it's led to disastrous results. A friend of mine was killed on Broadway just recently, and um, we need to we need to look and see can we move to something like Vision Zero, where we're striving to have zero traffic fatalities. Um, housing is going to be something that we're going to talk about as a council. We filed our housing element. Um, we have a number of efforts underway, but do we need to do more? Um, fiscal Fiscal sustainability is always something we look at. And um, what else can we do as far as downtown vitality and diversity, equity, inclusion to make people feel welcome? Um, So how can you guys get involved? First of all, if you have any sense of priority that you want to convey, my email is darling at walnut-creek.org. And just get to me before the 27th to let me know which else you think. Uh, We will have a Citizens Advisory Committee for Measure O, and that was a feature that was as part of the ballot measure. We will be recruiting this spring and summer to have them on board so that we have a group of our residents looking at what we're doing to make sure that what we're doing is consistent with the way Measure O was uh, 
portray when we took it to the voters. You know, we it is a general fund measure, so that money goes into the general fund, and we made a strong commitment that we will track it separately. We will address the priorities that people gave us, um, and we're looking to hold ourselves accountable through that citizens advisory committee. And then the last thing is we do have the two planning efforts, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sustainability coming to us this spring. If you're interested in those, that's a good chance to take a look at those plans and see if it includes everything that you want. And um, I know things like water recycling and solar and solar with storage are important out here. So take a look at those plans and make sure they address those things. Um, so that's kind of a nutshell of what we're doing. It's a, The budget cycle is going to go on through this summer and when we finally adopt the city's budget for the next two years. And um, so lots of opportunities for you to get involved. Okay, any questions? Maxine. I love living in Walnut Creek, and I thank you and, and the whole community for all that you do. I'm proud of the whole downtown area. I love the art. I love the restaurants. Anything, thoughts about better parking situation? Um, I find in in some of our friends will like we won't go there after three o'clock. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to yeah. throw that out. Yeah. It's wonderful to have outdoor dining, but now there's so yeah. You know yeah, that. one of the I mean that is a big trade off with the outdoor dining. Yeah. We did lose about a hundred parking spots on the street um, when we did that. The city monitors parking downtown, and where we look for an eighty five percent. Um, occupancy of our parking that's available downtown, the on street and the garages. Um, I know for a person that has uh, mobility issues, the garages are a little bit more difficult. I've taken my dad through there a few times <laughs> and recognized that. But that's what I do because it's almost always available and it's easier than trying to find that last little parking spot on the street. Uh, but it is something that we recognize, and that's why we're being careful as we go forward with the outdoor dining to make sure that we don't adversely impact the, the parking. Okay, uh, Jill and then Ted. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the office space issues, residential, not residential, recreational issues and housing. Mm -hmm. Are there plans for additional um, multi-level residential buildings in the city? Um, the way the city's housing element, which is what we submitted to the state last month, um, lays it out, we have, the state asked us to plan for 5,805 new residential units. We anticipate the majority of those will be multifamily housing downtown with a certain number of um, auxiliary dwelling units, which are those little granny flats in people's backyards or people. Um, my neighbor converted her house into a duplex, so her daughter shares the house with her. So most of the development will be the, the denser housing downtown. It's nothing, the housing element didn't include anything new. It was all planning that we had done as part of West Downtown and North Downtown. So we were light years ahead of some cities, because some cities were running around going, where are we going to put them? I don't know. But we were like, well, we've got a plan. So. Uh, Ted and Leanne. Uh, there is a project coming up in the next couple of years for Heather Farms. Is, uh, um, is there a water conservation piece tied into that uh, with all the remodeling they're going to be doing? Yeah, the, um, our direction to the staff as they begin to work with the architect is that we want that facility to be the embodiment of our sustainability action plan. So uh, water conservation, um, Alternative energy, it will include solar panels. It will, you know, we're looking to see if we can include battery storage in there. And so, yes, water conservation will be part of it, um, and as well as the energy conservation. Yeah, I just wondered how the city fared during the New Year's storms. Yeah, we did okay. We had one culvert blowout in Lakewood. Um, our public, or public work staff knows who goes underwater, and so they go out ahead of time, and they work with those neighborhoods to make sure that they are raking their leaves, cleaning their gutters, that the ditches that are on private property are flowing correctly. Uh, we did lose a fair amount of the trails up in the open space have damage to them. But overall, we survived relatively okay. Okay, great. Any other questions for Cindy? Cindy, thank you very much. And um, next month, I will be in Japan, and one of my other council members will be here. So I will miss you. And um, All right. Hope it's a fun trip. I hope so, too. My <laughs> husband is not sure about 
Japanese breakfast. We'll see. <laughs> He'll survive. <laughs> Next up is uh, financial reports. Uh, January financial results are a little bit different than what we've experienced uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, here to tell us about it, Mary Hurd, Treasurer, and Joel Lesser, CFO. Thank you, Dwight. Uh, at the end of January 2023, revenue was under budget for the first time in a long time, primary because of the unfavorable revenue variance because of golf. That was a total of $232,000. It's just not possible to play golf when it's raining that way. As well, total expenses were under budget by 180,000. The major reason for this continues to be uh, unfilled positions. Overall, revenue of $2,805,000 exceeded expenses of $2,350,000 by $455,000. There's a net negative budget variance, revenue less expenses of 51,000 for January. And now Joel can give us greater information. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Mary. So uh, that was a good overview of the GRF uh, financials. I'll go into the uh, trust report. So the beginning cash balance for the trust estate fund was uh, uh, eight million six hundred twenty-eight thousand. We had uh, additions to the trust fund of two hundred and seventy-eight thousand. Of that, two hundred thousand was the membership transfer fee. And that was uh, uh, substantially under uh, under plan. Um, the market is a little bit slow now, so January was significantly below plan. The total expenditures uh, in the month of January were uh, just under uh, $515,000, uh, primarily for um, bank uh, loan and, and principal, um, interest and principal payments, along with... Uh, capital expenditures. So the ending cash balance in the trust account uh, as of January 31st was uh, 8391000 So uh, MOD financials, there was a uh, total revenue of 866 k total expenses of 894000 So there was actually a deficit in MOD of about uh, $27,000. So the primary reason here uh, is there is a, uh, a revenue shortfall in the month of January of about $148,000. Uh, however, expenses were under budget by about 86000 but because of the revenue shortfall, we had a slight deficit of uh, just over 27,000. And I'll, I'll pause there, see if there's any questions on the financials. Any questions for Joel? So Joel, we had some storm damage in January. Do these financial statements reflect any of that, the costs associated with that damage? So let's see, I've got a, another slide here. Uh, yeah. Javier could bring that up. I'll go over the storm damages. So, uh, so in the month of uh, January, on the capital side, there were, MO, uh, as we all know, there were really two parts uh, for storm damages, one for the MOD building and the other uh, on the grounds uh, associated with uh, mudslides and earth movement. So the MOD damages are uh, $83,000. That is capital uh, because it's associated with a building. Um, and those expenditures were recognized in the month of January under capital. They'll be capitalized once they're complete um, in the month of January. Uh, the mudslides uh, are... Uh, $28,000 that was actually expended or paid in the month of January. But since the storm damages, uh, since the storm occurred at the end of 2022, we're going for the, for the damages that occurred right at that point in time, we're going to accrue those expenses in 2022 rather than expense them in 2023. So uh, mudslide damages that were actually paid 
uh, so far are $28,000. Again, that will be accrued for in 2022. Um, there are, uh, we have some significant estimates for damages that are still to be complete. Um, so we have a variety of quotes for mudslides and a retaining wall and some additional drainage that is recommended by the vendor. So the mudslide estimates are $167,000, and the additional drainage is $73,000. So these have not been, have been started. They're just estimates at this point. Uh, so again, those were all damages uh, essentially done at the end of 2022. So a total uh, is 351K, which is the $83,000 in capital and the remaining in operating. However, there was a major slide that occurred in mid-January. Um, we're still getting estimates for that. It's very significant. Um, nothing really has been um, uh, done other than, you know, clearing the golf course. Uh, but we, we, we really don't have any firm estimates for the major slide. Uh, but since it happened in mid-January, any, any expenditures that will actually be paid will be recognized in 2023. So just to <clears throat> clarify, the 351 is being recognized in 2022. Correct. Okay. So not a part of the financial statements we're looking at, nor the major slide estimate. Correct. So it, it well, one other question before I, I move ahead. So the MOD damages were water damages, right? Flood, flooding damages. Is that covered by our insurance? Have we, have we filed a claim? So, uh, so we've contacted the insurance so the, uh, since the, um, the aggregate damages exceed the deductible of $250,000, we did place a claim with the insurance company. Uh, we, uh, Paul and I, toured the, and showed the damages to uh, an insurance representative. We're not quite sure if it's going to be covered. Uh, certainly the damages associated with the building are covered, but that's well under the deductible. We do not know if mudslides and earth movements are actually covered under the policy. So that's, that's a work in progress. Right. So, Joel, we're, we're starting in a bad spot in January. We're behind budget. We've got some unrecognized expenses with the slide. Can we get back to budget by the end of the year? Do you, do you see a way for us to get there? Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, I, I guess it just depends on uh, the, uh, the membership transfer fee activity, membership transfer fee activity, and uh, how well we do with golf revenue and and events and other things that are planned during the year. So uh, I really don't know. Lee. In the past, when the budget year has started out in a negative, have there been attempts for leadership to look at departments and start to trim down a little bit to help with the situation? I mean, do you know? No, I haven't been here long enough to really answer that question, so I, I, I really can't say from past experience. So we have had some of those preliminary discussions, but we're, we are so early in the, in the year. Um, that's something we probably would really start focusing in about after the first quarter. We have a little bit more experience of what to anticipate the rest of the year. There certainly is significant savings in salaries and, and so forth from open positions. So we'll have a better idea of where we, we are in, in, into the first quarter. Let's do that before Joel leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Joel or Mary? All right, thank you very okay. much. So next up is the uh, GM report, Jeff. So I've had the opportunity to have a, a town hall meeting and present to a, a few clubs. And, and during those meetings, I shared a video uh, of Ross Moore 
that really highlights everything Rossmore has to, to offer. The amenities, the clubs, um, all of the recreational programs and services. And it's just a really good reminder of what Rossmore is about. And I, I wanted to encourage residents, I know we've been through a fairly significant period of restrictions and limited programs and clubs have, have scaled back. Now's a good time as we've heard from the city, they've lifted all of their restrictions. Now's a great time to get out and just re-engage in some of those activities that maybe you've uh, put in the back burner for a while. You know, everybody has to evaluate to their own comfort level for sure, but check out the website. There's all those 200 clubs, something for everybody. Check out the recreation programs and services. Uh, as we start 2023, really look for opportunities to uh, evaluate what there is in Rossmore for for you. Um, so I just I wanted to encourage people to really think about how to re-engage if that is in their interest. The next item I have is regarding the, the drought. And certainly as we started off the year, uh, Joel just detailed some of the, the storm damage. We had significant rain at the end of 2022 and, and start of 23. We've got rain in the forecast over the next week, which is always encouraging. But the big question is, is the drought over? Um, so I've, I've had a chance to reach out to a, a colleague at, at East Bay Mud to probe a few questions. We've also been really focusing on water security and, and what is the future of water security for Rossmore. There are two uh, significant bills that are, have been uh, adopted, AB 1668 and Senate Bill 606. Those have to do with how water is uh, managed by local utilities. It gives local utilities a little more latitude on how they implement restrictions that may be mandated by the state. And East Bay Mud is really they've taken a lot of steps over the, the last several years and they're, they're in better shape than many utilities, water utilities. So as those progress through the, the state water agencies, we wanna make sure and, and monitor those because it has implications on how Rossmore uh, may expect to have restrictions in the future for irrigating our golf courses and so forth. Both those bills currently are still in the process of being uh, implemented through the state water agencies. One of the items that they, they also indicated and is part of our capital plan for 2023 is the uh, mandate to uh, not irrigate non-functional turf. So median islands and, and areas of turf that don't serve a, a active purpose. Uh, and they anticipate that this mandate will continue. So we will pr we'll proceed with those plans to remove. Uh, again, we have budgeted uh, for the median islands and, and portions of the golf course. And the last one, again, is, is, our, is East Bay Mud really considering that the uh, drought is over? Will they be lifting restrictions? They certainly acknowledge that they are in a much better place and we are uh, in a, a good position this year compared to last year. Uh, they anticipate at their meeting in April that they will take uh, formal action to consider how far they will lift those restrictions. But they, they want to encourage that kind of a life uh, long from now on, uh, conservation is, is going to be vital as California faces ongoing drought conditions in, in different uh, climates. So for now, there's uh, certainly restrictions and they will consider that in April, but conservation is encouraged. The next item I have is regarding fire safety. Uh, we had a presentation from the uh, fire marshal, Chris Bachman, at your last meeting and he highlighted the 3.1 million grants that has been received and the progress that, that they're making in implementing that. Hopefully by the, the uh, start of spring or end of spring, they will be able to actually go to the field, 
start that, that project, which removes a lot of the fuel, uh, encompassing about 85% of Rossmore. This is a significant step in uh, providing fire safety and security for the community. But one of the, the most important aspects of fire safety is just fire awareness. And we're, we're working with all of our uh, partner agencies and a new uh, pamphlet will be coming out, a booklet called Rossmore Residence Guide to Wildfire Preparedness and Evacuation. And we wanna encourage people to look for that as it comes out in the spring uh, and keep it handy, refer to it often. Uh, we want to thank our, our partner agencies, the City of Walnut Creek Emergency Preparedness Team, City of Walnut Creek Police Department, Contra Costa County Fire Protection District, and the Contra Costa County uh, Emergency Operations Center for their assistance and partnership in preparing that document. Finally, some employee transitions. In January, we had two employees uh, begin employment with GRF, Raphael Lazaret, landscape technician. Uh, Celesi Morgan, a bus driver. Yes, we did hire a bus driver. Uh, two employees did leave with uh, employment. Uh, of course, Tim O'Keefe, our, our CEO. And Daniel Valerio, a landscape technician. And then in January, two employees transferred to other departments. Tamara Holbrook, payroll benefits administrator. And myself as your general manager. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff? All right, moving on, uh, residence form, Deborah. Residents have up to three minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the residence forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented and members do consider them as they act during the meeting. Speakers must conduct themselves with proper decorum consistent with community standards that would not be offensive to a reasonable person, as determined at the sole discretion of the GRF board. Participants may not engage in personal attacks, threats of any kind, or any other disruptive behavior. Speakers violating these rules may be expelled from the meeting and precluded from speaking at future meetings as determined by the board. In-person forum instructions. Complete the residence forum slip and then give your slip to the board secretary. Copies of handouts or notes should also be given to the board secretary. Zoom forum instructions. If you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residence forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residence forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Okay, first up, we'll welcome Fran Gibson. Thank you very much. Good morning, directors. Good morning, Jeff. <clears throat> I'm hoarse this morning. Keep, keep on, Fran. I am here to, uh, I am the immediate past president of Rossmore Emergency Preparedness Organization, a 31-year-old resident volunteer group whose core mission, and I happen to believe we serve the best core mission in all of Rossmore, and I'll go to the mat on that, is to help our neighbors ready themselves and their households to be fully prepared for a major incident or disaster that could come. And uh, in that uh, in that vein, we did have a nomination uh, committee, and as is the Rossmore way, uh, a four-officer slate was presented, and then two weeks later, two of those people, for personal reasons, had to back out. So I am here today. We have nothing in our bylaws that says what you do when you don't have a president. I am not currently president, but I do by our bylaws serve for a year as the immediate past president. So I have Phil Mendelowitz with me here. What we're going to do is we're gonna do a hybrid model. 
for leadership. I'll, after all the effort we've made in this 31 years, I'll be darned, I hope that's an acceptable word, I'll be darned if I'll let the organization go down. So Phil and I will be working together. He's going to introduce himself. He's an EPO and a CERT member and an incredibly competent and experienced emergency management person. And we will work together to do our programming. Uh, one of your um, treasurers, Paul Rosenwhite, I think he served as treasurer here on the board for three years, and he served as a board director. And it always makes my heart glow as I look out on this uh, dais today, and I see three people who are involved in their neighborhoods in emergency preparedness. It, makes, it warms the cockles of my heart. We're going to be working with Tom Cashon in the next year for the international um, Tuesday, October 19th at 1019 will be the International Shakeout Drill Worldwide. And I take, as, as your former president of EPO, I take, just as you do in your emergency operations plan, I take a whole community, you have 30 seconds. whole community view and all hazards, so this is important. We're also pairing with a computer club and we're gonna have a, an emergency app fair where residents can come, bring their smartphones and get the four major uh, apps, warning systems we want on phones. And then last, lastly, I will attend tonight my first meeting at, on Chief Jamie Knox's community advisory board. I can't tell you that how time. happy I am to be and honored to be a part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fran. You did a good job of um, introducing us to the to your co-partner, Phil Mendelowitz, is next up to address us. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm happy to be part of the Rossmore community and feel that my past experience in manufacturing... One moment, please. Would you be so kind as to state your full name and Rossmore address? I'm sorry. Address? Philip Mendelowitz, 2409 Pine Knoll Drive, number 7. I'm happy to be part of the Rossmore community and feel that my past experience in manufacturing and community activities are a good match for the role I hope to play in EPO. My past experiences match well with the goals of ET EPO. I have 30 plus years in manufacturing where I took on many leadership positions and learned to be flexible in responding to immediate challenges that can come up in a production day, anywhere from a broken turn screw to down production lines or engine employee. I have had re I've been very resourceful in resolving these issues. I also have extensive experience in developing training materials, giving training, encouraging employee development. I have conducted or coordinated countless monthly safety meetings, always keeping them new and fresh and interesting. My focus has always been to develop or enhance company safety programs to minimize accidents and prepare for any circumstance that may occur. I believe strongly that we cannot succeed without a great diverse team with different points of views united by the same goal to provide support to our community. I hope to achieve that by providing leadership to the team and supporting growth through listening and trust. During my career, my teams have always hit or exceeded their production goals. EPO also allows me to give back to the community, which is something I strongly believe in. I was involved in the first preparatory budget process in Vallejo that developed a means to support local community projects using specific set-aside tax monies. I served on the Vallejo Ad Hoc Water Rate Commission, which developed an approach to enhancing water resources and budget needs for the ongoing projects associated with the improvements to the city water distribution. I also became a certain Vallejo seven years ago and have continued here in Walnut Creek um, and ready for any emergency that may come up. Now, along with my skills and membership and the mentorship of Fran, I can help my new fabulous community and be prepared for anything that comes up in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Lynn Carruthers. Oh. <laughs> Lynn Carruthers, 3152 Tice Creek Drive. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a new year. We have a new GM. So I'm here to update you on Neighbors for Safer Streets activities. Since last I saw you, we've launched a twice-monthly column, Safer Street Smarts, in the Rossmore News. 
Thank you, Ann Peterson. Like everything we do, the purpose of the column is to raise awareness of the safety issues on the streets and sidewalks of our community. There are a variety of small tasks our residents can help with here at Rossmore. For example, reporting trees that are blocking traffic signs, crosswalk flag containers that need replacing, curbs that need their red paint refreshed, potential tripping hazards. So partnering with the amazing Tom Cashin, we're going to create a system of reporting so Tom and John T have this information readily available and can manage these small and important tasks as they see fit. In collaboration with Becky Smith and Tom Conti, we're developing an informative and entertaining program we will bring to clubs, orgs, mutuals, entry gatherings, when it gets warmer. The purpose is to put faces to names, so residents will meet Tom and Becky. We hope that by seeing and hearing their stories about what happens when you're struck by a car driven by someone who's not paying attention or should no longer be driving, or both, Residents will have a deeper understanding and feel what it's like when your entire life changes in a minute. I'm delighted to tell you that Becky is healing. She regularly takes our bus to and from PT. She's been shopping at Macy's with her granddaughter, and her grandson has resumed his happy habit of spending weekends here with his grandparents. I mentioned Tom Conti will be part of our program. I suspect you're not familiar with his name. And I wasn't either until Tom texted me in January. Last spring, one week after Kurt Gunn's fatal accident, Tom was hit by a car driven by a resident on Tice Creek Drive. She was driving a Prius, so Tom didn't hear her coming. He was hit from behind, and when the resident realized that something was stuck under her car, she backed up and ran over him. Like Becky, Tony has spent months in hospital and rehab, and like Becky, he is still recovering and learning, learning to live a very different life. And also like Becky, he is a cheerful, practical person who is interested in making changes here at Rossmore so we can you be- You have 30 seconds. As Tom says, even safer. Now yesterday morning, another resident, Ross, Rossmore resident, was walking and struck by a car driven by a Rossmore resident. This occurred at the corner of Tice Creek Drive and Stanley Dollar, a large, clearly marked intersection with crossing flags and stop signs at all four corners. We do know that the pedestrian left the scene with moderate injuries and she was talking on her phone, which I find to be a great relief. And that yet another time. accident in our community during broad daylight that could have been prevented. Thank you for your time. Stay warm. Thank you, Lynn. There are no resident forum speakers on Zoom, so that concludes the residents forum. Okay, thank you, Deborah and Jill. Next up is uh, Finance Committee. Adrian Byram and his committee have been up to some important work. Adrian, we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to touch on a, a couple of things that, uh, before the recommendations. Um, I know many of you were at the meeting uh, virtually or in person. Um, Joel presented um, the uh, GenArc replacement plan, wh what's going to be going on, uh, a series of slides that uh, were, was very informative, uh, gives me a great deal of confidence that we know what um, the, the project is in, in under control and in good hands. Um, and so I think that's a, a very uh, important step. Um, I, the committee asked that a... Um, uh, as we do this report every month, that uh, uh, um, we have a, a statement of how we are compared to budget. Because one of the problems with this project is that it, the expenses are in, in various different areas. Some, some of them are in MOD, some of them are capital, some of them are operating. So it's gonna be hard to keep track of everything unless we have a uh, a statement that we see every month, and we we'll, we need to be very careful about that. Um, as uh, Dwight noted, um, we're in a rather unusual situation this year. The last three years we've had surpluses every year. Um, this year we probably will not. Um, and with these various uh, expenses that are coming in from storm damage, um, so it's very important that we maintain control over the general 
replacement project and its expenses? Um, we continued our discussion on earthquake insurance. Um, there was a number of questions and issues that we sort of surfaced. Um, I'll, I'll be putting out a report to everybody, sort of outlining those, and we'll try and move forward with um, coming up with recommendations over the next two months or so. Um, we, may, we recommended that um, mod resale and alteration fees, as suggested by Paul Donner, that those be approved. That would help resolve the uh, uh, revenue shortfall in uh, MOD that we saw. Uh, we also uh, recommended that the board um, approve a request for replacement of the switcher equipment uh, for Rossmore Television. Um, we recommended that the GRF board uh, fund a pension liability analysis to be performed by Millman. Um, just to touch on that slightly. Um, the, we have this continuing uh, liability with our pensions. We've been putting aside a certain amount of money, about a million dollars a year over the last several years. We have the opportunity of buying an annuity and, and, uh, um, and thereby avoiding that uh, continuing charge. Uh, up till now, this has not been a, a viable alternative because of interest rates of being very low. So buying an annuity is not a good idea, but now they are high and interest rates are high, so buying an annuity may be a good idea. And so that's why we, sh we should understand this option. And finally, we recommended that um, the board, uh, that staff negotiate a five-year extension to the Comcast cable uh, and internet service that we have. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's a very good idea. Any questions? And we'll be addressing each of those recommendations in the next items here. Any questions at this point for Adrian? Okay. If not, uh, Ann Peterson, you want to tell us about the uh, switcher equipment that will allow us at home, no, wait, at home to watch concerts from the event center in HD? Maybe. Actually, Maybe not. HD could be coming very quickly. Um, Comcast is looking at that as we speak. So what we're actually here for today, we're requesting $25,000 for a new switcher equipment for Rossmore TV that will allow them to operate out of the event center. So the switcher equipment is kind of like the central nervous system, if you will, of everything Rossmore TV does. It allows us to alternate from one camera to another, so we can run multiple cameras at the same time. We can drop slides in, we can do our opening and closing credits. It's also what allows us to do the live programming. So we need it. Uh, George, when this, the computer failed on the switcher equipment after we'd already had a few other issues, like the actual switcher handle broke, um, George did some research to find out what it would cost if we replaced it with an identical model to what we had, and it was going to be 52000 before taxes. So he did a little more research and found a comparable unit, didn't have all the functionality, but everything we needed. That all-in-one was going to cost 44000 Recognizing we needed to be as inexpensive as possible, George and Brendan Kelly, our studio supervisor, then researched what it would cost if we built our own. So buying the individual pieces and putting together a custom model with the help of a company called Black Magic, we can do it for between twenty three and 25000 George and Brendan are convinced that they can do this with Black Magic's help. It would have the same type of warranty that we would have if it was an all-in-one. One of the benefits of this as well is if we are building this with our you know, individual pieces, if one piece breaks, it's a lot easier to fix that than it is an all-in-one. Um, the all-in-one we currently have is about nine to 10 years old. We expect to get the same longevity out of one that we custom built. Any questions? Maxine? Is there any downside to building it ourselves? The time involved, it would take, I mean, an all-in-one would come ready to go. George and Brendan will actually have to put this together, so you're probably talking a couple of days to a week. But when you consider what we're going to save, a week is not that much time. Okay. Uh, Ted? I would, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion uh, to consider the recommendation from the Finance Committee to approve the replacement of the switcher equipment for uh, Rossmore Television in the amount of $25,000 to be paid uh, from the trust fund. I'll second. OK. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, Deborah, roll call. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Amaji. Yes. Ali. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Meehan. Yes. And Topper. Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. And Anne, please thank uh, Brendan and George for efficient spending I will. of dollars. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, alterations and resale fee structure. I think Paul Donner is, uh, uh, come on down, Paul. Uh, it's his turn to uh, tell us all about alterations and resale fees. Okay, good morning. So as a background, the resale and alteration fees are used to offset the cost of the department. The department consists of a chief inspector, uh, two alteration and resale inspectors, and a resale coordinator. So there's there's four positions in there that we use to offset the cost, along with any other overhead they might have. Uh, the fees were last adjusted in 2019, so it's been a couple of years since we've done that. Well, we've been doing pretty well with the department because of so many uh, alterations, frankly, and resales as was alluded to by the mayor in the city of Walnut Creek, we had the same uh, experience here. Uh, but we're not seeing that anymore. And last year, the department, for the first time in a long time, actually showed a loss of about $68,000. So I want to get ahead of that rather than try to play catch up later. So we've adjusted the fees, or recommending adjusting the fees, incrementally across the scale, uh, anywhere from $25 to $50 per transaction. Any questions for Paul? Ted? Uh, just one question. On an enclosure of a deck is $500. And a complete remodel you have down uh, as a suggested increase at $800. Is the $800 enough for a complete remodel? Because that could include an enclosure too. And I don't know how much time it takes for you guys to do all your inspections and stuff. And I know that gets burned uh, up the cost. I, I, but. I think it is. And the, the complete remodel could, I think it's, it shows as actually a sliding scale from 500 to 800. Uh, and a lot of the remodels do uh, include the, the enclosure with it. Uh, we're not seeing a whole lot of enclosures anymore because the restrictions from city codes are, are pretty tight and it really drives the cost up. But yeah, yeah I think those are covered there. Okay. Any other questions? Leanne? I hope this is on track, but during the finance committee, you gave a good example of why Rossmore has permits and why the city has permits. Could you just summarize that for sure, the residents? Absolutely. So there, there, is two, there are two permits associated with an alteration. The first one is the, the mutual permit. It's not an MOD permit. It's a mutual permit. I want to make that clear. Uh, we don't approve anything. The mutuals do. And then there's the city permit. And uh, many residents ask, why do we have to have both? The mutual permit comes first, and the mutual permit is there to ensure compliance with mutual policies and procedures and, and aesthetics, basically. The city permit is to ensure compliance with city codes. So obviously, the, the mutual permit, our inspectors are going to look at city codes and, and not uh, recommend approval on anything that's not up to code. But as far as the code inspections and enforcement, that's on the city. And the city will not issue a city permit for work until they have seen the mutual permit. So mutual permit comes first. Okay, so follow-up question. So the mutual permit actually protects the investment of the mutual in that building. Absolutely. That's okay. the entire reason for the permit. Any other questions for Paul? Paul, you, in the past, you benchmarked these fees against like communities and mm -hmm. organizations. Is it the same case here? Same case. I'd say we're, we're in the middle. There are, there are some communities that have no fees because they put everything on the coupon, but you're I don't think that's equitable because those that aren't doing alterations are, are helping to fund that. Uh, so that is the other option. But yes, our, our fees are right, right about in the middle. And so just to clarify for residents, not, none of these fees are on the coupon. No the, fees are on the coupon and none of the uh, labor force is on the coupon. Right, right, thank you. All right, any other discussion? Carol? Um, I'll make a motion. Okay. 
I move that the board approve as written the updated fee, fee schedule for resale and alterations. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Ted, oh, Ted, second, thank you. Any further discussion? If not, roll call, Deborah. Uh, certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hart? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, pension liability analysis, and Joel's going to introduce this topic. Okay, so on the uh, the pension plan, so we have a, a, a organization called Milliman. Milliman is both the record keeper and the actuary for the pension plan. Um, so uh, the the proposed liability study uh, would be performed by Milliman, and the essentially the study would um, determine how much of a lump sum payment would be required in order to eliminate the annual contributions to the plan. So that's, that's kind of it in, a, in the nutshell. Um, it, this, uh, this idea came about in terms of, you know, if and when the medical center sells, uh, that could be a source of funding to, uh, to again eliminate the liability associated with the pension plan. Any questions for Joel? Uh, Joel, so in t I know that the pension liability hasn't been uh, explored at the end of uh, 2022 yet. We don't have those numbers, but what is the unfunded pension liability at this point? I would have to look back at the records to give you a good number. I, I frankly just don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's around five million, but um, so so that really results from the pension not being adequately funded in the past. So what we're talking about is how. Mm, I think it's uh, actually that five million that you're referring to is the difference between what the what gap requires in terms of discount rates, because they're more conservative than the record keeper. Or the actuary. Okay. So that five million dollars is is really not a technical shortfall. It is a gap requirement in terms of being more conservative on the discount rate. Right. It's also subject to market fluctuations, uh, stocks and bonds. Right. Correct. So so this analysis that you're proposing would take a look at all of that to say where are we and where could we be ten years from now to see what we need to fund. Yes, uh, but primarily the the idea is to um, uh, to determine how much it would be to essentially buy out the liability. So, well, we'll so also there so at, there would be no continuing uh, contribution to the plan. Right. Well, they also just take a look if buying out the plan is not appropriate at this time, what the appropriate annual contribution should be yes. going forward. Okay, great. Any other questions for Joel? Mary? Mr. President, I'd like to move that the board approve up to between $7,500 and $10,000 to fund the punch and liability analysis to be performed by Milliman. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Maxine, thank you. Uh, should we make that not to exceed 10,000 just to keep it easier or is that okay okay. as worded not to exceed 10,000 would be my recommendation are you okay Maxine you okay with that change good. okay all right any further discussion um, I have a question yes um, so this on the agenda it says the 7.5 to 10,000 is unbudgeted and Comparing it to the TV switcher equipment, that says it'll be paid from the trust fund. Um, is this also coming from the trust fund? Is it just the way somebody wrote it, or is there a difference between something that's unbudgeted and like what's the difference between these two expenditures? So, so the um, uh, so Anne's equipment is capital that would be coming from the trust fund. 
This is operating expense. It's not capital. So these expenses would be uh, would be going to both GRF and MOD on the on the PL. And the and these expenditures are not budgeted. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Uh, roll call, Deborah. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Looking forward to those results. <laughs> Jeff, I, you know, in terms of being efficient with uh, spending and efficient with our coupon, why don't you tell us about Comcast? And this is a, a good news story. Um, GRF has had a, a long-standing history with Comcast to provide bulk uh, cable and internet services to residents. The uh, monthly fees for those is included in the GRF portion of the coupon. We, uh, our current agreement with Comcast expires at the end of this year, so we have been engaged in negotiations on a new uh, extension. And before you is a proposal for a five-year extension. It is based on the same package, essentially, as uh, they are delivering currently with a few enhancements. But just to recap, it includes the Ultimate lineup with HD, uh, one X1 box, including, this is a new portion, 20 hours of cloud DVR storage. It includes the sports and entertainment package, which was added uh, a few years back, and the important component of that is it has the Turner Classic Movies embedded in that uh, package. <clears throat> the internet is uh, the fast 400 internet with modem. And this is an enhancement in terms of speed. It is a 410 uh, down and up megabit bytes per second. They will maintain our existing common area Wi-Fi service. And again, that is being upgraded uh, as well. Uh, there is a few areas of expansion. And they are uh, going to be delivering our channel 28 in HD uh, programming. So that is, uh, again, another enhancement. The fee for this is actually going to be held at the current rates through the end of 2024. So the first time this, uh, the fees could go up would be January of 2025. The uh, fee is $57.20 plus applicable fees and taxes. Compared to the, uh, the retail rates, that same package would cost $222.74. So that represents a, a savings on a monthly basis for every household of $165.54. So a pretty darn good, good deal. The new uh, contract would go into effect basically in, in March and then carry through for a, a five-year term. And we are seeking your approval. Any questions? What do you pay? A lot more. <laughs> With free voice so you can vouch for that higher price. I'm thinking even the two twenty two uh, retail is sounds a little low compared to what I'm paying, but uh. <laughs> and just to be clear, this does not include premium services. Each resident is is responsible for their own uh, streaming package or whatever beyond, uh, but it does include the internet access. That is correct. So the even if you are a fan of just streaming, you don't watch cable, this is still a phenomenal deal. The, the internet portion alone uh, for the fast 400 retails for $83 in this package is $22.50. So either way, it's still a, a great deal. Okay. Uh, Ted? So you said there was going to be upgrade to the surrounding areas, the Xfinity on the outside. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. I use it on the golf course and everything, you know, log into Xfinity, and it goes everywhere. Uh, but what do you mean when they say that they're going to increase the uh, – is it speed or is it uh, – it's, it's speed. Oh, okay. Will that improve my golf game? <laughs> it, it may. It may. All right, any other – any other questions? 
Uh, like Leanne? Me, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Uh, I move that the board approve the Comcast bulk service agreement extension. Uh, that includes the details listed in item 8.4 of the agenda. Okay. Is there a second? I'll Ted? Second. Oh, Mary, you've got to be quicker. Uh, <laughs> any other discussion? All right. Deborah, roll call. Roll call, please. I'm sorry, I didn't catch who seconded. Ted. Ted. Thank you. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. So thank you, Jeff, for um, making the first non-increase in the coupon for cable next year. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, board committee, I'm so sorry, golf advisory, Mike Wiener, special guest today. Welcome. Burke Ferrari is uh, away playing golf, I hope, in a sunny spot and uh, escaped our winter weather here. Mike, welcome. Uh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, I was in Mexico for a couple of weeks, but Burke and, and a couple of others are down at Cabo San Lucas, and it's only 75 today. And I can't improve Ted's golf game at all. But I'm happy to report on the, our last meeting and, and the golf course. You've all received about 20 pages uh, in your packet of golf information. And um, as you all know, we had a, a great storm which uh, caused mudslides and trees down and uh, a closing of the golf course. Uh, for some reason, nobody could play or wanted to play during uh, that time. Uh, the income of uh, the, the golf course for the month of uh, last month was down 67%. That's because nobody came in, nobody uh, bought anything, nobody played golf, etc. cetera. Uh, apparently, this is, uh, we have about six or eight weeks every year where there's problems, either drought or it's too hot, where things are down. Um, at the moment, Creekside uh, course is fully open. Uh, the ninth hole um, is cart path only. Uh, three of the holes on the 18 course uh, either are shorter or, uh, uh, or some other alteration so it's playable. But the, the courses are playable. The crew is ahead of uh, time as far as repair of the mudslides uh, and trees down and so on. Um, Dickie Nita, who's our uh, uh, longtime head marshal of 16 years, has resigned. Uh, he has been here 16 years, and there's a document that states um, that once you're a Chief Marshal for 12 years, you could play golf free for the rest of uh, uh, time until you, you uh, get buried on the golf course or, or some other thing. Um, so I, I'm not sure if we need an action to uh, accept his resignation. But a second item is uh, the board um, nominated uh, and seconded uh, Richard Fuller being the new uh, head marshal. So I don't know if, if those are action items or, or whatever. And I'm here to answer any questions you'd like about golf. So first of all, thank you, Mike. Uh, and those don't require board action, and the Golf Advisory Committee has already acted on that. But we want you to pass along our congratulations to uh, Dickie Nitta, and we'll see him on the course. And Good, I will. All right, any questions for Mike? All right, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. All right, next up is compensation. Uh, Jill Alley and Eric Wong. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the compensation committee met for a February meeting. Um, I forgot what that exact date was, and we went over a few things or agenda for this year. Uh, also, the February was a time to report out on the 2022 activity for employment numbers and things. And so, there's a lot of data that we went over, um, as well as to talk about other type of employer retention programs. All of this is covered in the the uh, report that was submitted. Are there any questions that you have? 
so it, was there anything out of the ordinary? And I, they're called look back reports. I'm not really sure why that is, but <laughs> looking at 22, 2022 uh, reports, was there anything out of the ordinary that, that came to the surface oh, during the committee? always something out of the ordinary. <laughs> but I, I would say just as a highlight, and this is not a, a good data number to to tout, but um, our turnover was quite a bit high. So what I say is for employees, we generally look at a, a, a good or healthy turnover, if you will, of about 10 to 11 percent. Ours was double, double that. Um, of the turnover, so the, the turnover that we had was 22.97 uh, percent. Um, of those, uh, non-union employees, employees was 20.69%, and for union employees, that was 26.25%. So we experienced, uh, on the union side, a quite a number of uh, retirements. And that kind of uh, coincides with the age population. About 47.5% of our employees are 40, uh, 55 and above. So it's we're above the norm. We don't have a lot of the younger folks like some of the other employers too. So the implications for us as time goes on, there are a lot of employees that are in that in that tier that will continue to retire or leave because they reach that age. Um, also, the pension, as we talked about before, is a factor as well. And as those uh, individuals kind of meet pension eligibility requirements, we expect them to leave. Anybody else? Uh, Ted? Maxine? So... Um I, I do have a little concern about the amount of people who are in the age group who could possibly be retiring. Uh, maybe you can call it said age group tenure with our business. We, that's a lot of knowledge there. And is and maybe this is not the committee that's doing that, but is there some concern about the uh, training up to take care of those positions? Because we could be talking, what, uh, anywhere from two to five years, there could be a huge turnover here. Uh, well, and that's, that's a good observation, Ted, that that is a concern for us as most employers. I, it is a concern for us because we do run uh, lean overall. So the capacity for training and learning and passing on this information, we try to take any opportunity we can to get employees involved with learning experience projects so they can get some of that knowledge. But you're right, as you have your older uh, uh, employees leaving, there's a lot of things that go with that. And just as a good example, in organizations, you can have standard operating procedures. What we all know is that you can't detail every single thing within a set of instructions. There are those like, here are the instructions, but oh, we forgot about this. You know, this is an exception to that. So a lot of that knowledge that's based with the older employees kind of goes out the door. So yes, there is a lot of, of need to help mentor and train up younger employees with that knowledge so when those exit or retire that some of that's passed on but it but it is a concern do we have a plan or what's being done to help encourage the hiring of younger employees are there internships available what kind of thing can be done make younger middle-aged people who we hope will stay here a long long time there's no direct way to address that. There are many variables that are occurring within um, our particular time and labor market. Um, you know, a, a, the previous generation, you would see a higher level of longevity. W whether you had a pension or not, there is that commitment to stay with positions. And so when you look at resumes these days, it's very common to see, you know, two, two three years here, um, and that's kind of the norm. So unless there's a compelling reason for an, uh, a person to stay, it's, it's, it's hard. And, and because you have, I discussed this in, in previous committee meetings, we have four generations of workers, the, the boomers, the Xers, the Yers, the Zers, and each generation has different motivators, things that attract them. For those who are on the older end of the spectrum, pensions are highly appealing. For those on the, on the younger side, it's what, what happened during COVID. It's like, can I work remotely? So there's other types of things that they look for. So for us to offer a package that kind of just attracts, it, it's really difficult to do. So employers these days have to pick their marketing platform as well as their benefits package to center around in those key positions that are going to add the best, the most bang for your buck, if you will. 
How do our numbers compare with other organizations, either like organizations or general organizations in the community? Well, well uh, you, you mean in terms of uh, retention or? Uh, not so our, much retention, our, our but turnover? just the turnover numbers. Uh, is that you said 22%? Mm -hmm. Is that the same across the board? Is that I don't. The same I haven't the community? done a, a look to see how that's been impacted. Again, the 10 to 11 percent is a good, healthy number for organizations to center on. But I do know that because of COVID, all organizations and industries have 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 seen turnover, mostly on the services end. There have been some markets that are more stable. For example, education and government jobs, their turnover rates a lot lower than the average. Okay. Uh, so, Eric, I, I was asking a leading question, of things out of the ordinary, because one of the things that I know you do and the Compensation Committee does is take a look at the compensation management system that's now been in place for, what, up almost 10 years, and you do a rigorous analysis of how well that system is working each year. And and so when you said the only thing out of the ordinary was turnover, I assume then that the CMS or compensation management system is working very well. It is. I, I, okay. And so here's a positive highlight. It, it is working very well. And one of the indicators we look at is to see at the end of the year, do we have employees that fall below or above the bands that we've established for positions? So number one, we have a mechanism for looking at our wages to compare in the marketplace to say, are our positions, when you compare it to similar jobs, within range? And we create a range based on that. So we're not looking at some just like, oh, we think we should pay somebody X amount. No, it's, it's structured. So we have the ranges. And according to the CMS, you know, we pay individuals within that band. So if you're lower than that, you should be brought up to a minimum. If you're higher than that, then you're capped until the, the band is evaluated and it's increased. Um, or there are other other changes to that that would warrant a, a look at maybe, you know, we're out of market for that. So over the years, when the CMS uh, was first implemented, you saw a lot of outliers, those that were above and below. But steadily, even before I arrived here, and even after I arrived, you see this decrease. So you look at the results of 2022, we have no employees that are below the cap and know that none that are above. The few that were reached at the above, they're capped out. They receive a lump sum amount in that. But that also triggers, it's like, well, maybe it's time for us to take a look at this wage ban. And it may have been three or four years. And so maybe it's time to increase that. So it is operating. We're right in the zone. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, anything else for compensation? All right. Thanks, Eric. Next up is planning. Uh, Leanne Hamaji. Yeah. So we had a um, pretty short meeting for a change. That was nice. I like that. Um, we met Fred Ponce of ArchPath Project Delivery. He is stepping in temporarily to do project planning um, where Jeff used to do the project planning. So he gave us a report on the pickleball building going in at the event, uh, near the event center, uh, describing the, the process and the, uh, the use of the Butler building, which is a type of... Um, building, and then how that would interact with the solar panels placed near the top. So um, he said that there is going to be very detailed analysis from uh, last week till March, till our March meeting, and he'll have a, an estimate of um, what's involved in that project and costs at our March planning committee meeting. That's about it. Okay. Any, any questions for planning? All right. Next is policy, Maxine Topper. Thank you. Um, the committee met on February 13th, and we were pleased to see approximately 25 people come to speak at the meeting. We love when the community gets involved. The biggest issue was the um, political columns in the, in the Rossmore News that had been put on hiatus due to the difficulty that the staff has had in the time it takes for fact checking. Uh, and Peterson did an excellent job of sharing a PowerPoint and explaining why and how the facts need to be checked, even in opinion columns, and what kind of time it takes for that to happen. Both sides were represented. 
people wanted to, the columns to remain and others felt that there was no need for the columns. So that was discussed at length. Um, that conversation was then tabled until the next month to see how that unfolds and there will be more discussion on that as well. Several um, residents as well as staff made good suggestions as to how that all might be resolved. The other issue that was discussed was um, idling and people, many people in the community are concerned about staff as well as residents leaving their cars on just to keep warm or charge their, their um, phones or do paperwork. So that was discussed and it was suggested that there be a, an anti-idling pledge for staff that will be worked on um, and then discussed again at the next meeting to see if that's a viable option. Thank and you. when is your next meeting? Uh, March 15th. Okay. At 1 one thirty, and everybody's invited. So at 24 residents in residence form, that's a, that can be a long meeting. Uh, any other comments? But they that, are welcome. Yes, they are. Any questions for Maxine? Ted. So a, a pledge sometimes is hard to do uh, and get it... Um, uh, I'm, my piece, my question is, I'm really concerned about the uh, how something like that would be policed. Mm -hmm. But I can, I'm good on reminders, and I just was wondering, does anybody consider just having a sticker put in the car that just says, "Please uh, shut off engine when not in use"? Uh, to re that would be in every Ross in every of the vehicles for MOD and they would have that and could, that would be in front of them each time to see that. And they would go, you know, whether I'm, you know, if I'm not needed to do this, I'll shut it down. And might be better than having a pledge that disappears and not in front of them. Just Thank a thought. Thank you for that. That was under consideration as well. And even though we may create a pledge, that will be up to the committee and the board and the staff to decide whether or not that will be used and how they will address the issue. Okay, anything else for Maxine? All right, thank you, Maxine. And at this point, uh, let's take a five minute break. So we'll come back at 1027, if I did my math right. Did I do my math right? <laughs> All right, it is 1027. We'd like to get underway again. And there's always one straggler. <laughs> <laughs> so new business, I understand um, we have some conversations in the back. If we could wind up those conversations, that would be good. So uh, Tom, uh, we'd like to call this meeting back to order. Thank you. Uh, so some enhancements to uh, Iris Park. John Tawajarna, Tawajarna, uh, almost Tawajarna. Um, so the Mindful Living Co Club is a uh, seeking approval for a memorial bench in Iris Park. Um, the, uh, the bench is to memorialize not only their founder, but uh, the values for uh, the group. Um, they've picked a certain location in the park. Uh, I've met them out there. We're planning to do a small little decomposed um, area for the bench to sit on. And uh, the plaque is going to read as uh, the following. Rossmore Mindful Living Club, practice compassion, gratitude, helpfulness, forgiveness, and loving kindness. Founded 2015 by Rossmore resident Dick Powell. Um, any other questions? So, John, memorial benches... Mm -hmm. Are, are many times requested. What guidelines do we tend to tell uh, residents? Um, th there's some general terms of for the plaque of what we don't want to see um, on there. Um, you know, try to stay away from generic word wording like in loving memory, things like that. Uh, we also want to make it clear that it has to be a Rossmore resident. You know, in this case, it's kind of a club as well. Um, 
because sometimes people will want to memorialize their parent, right? And if they weren't a resident, that's not really allowed. Um, I, they, they follow all the guidelines in this instance. They contact me first. Um, you know, they're, they're very willing to go along with all the guidelines. And, um, you know, I support this decision to add a bench. At Maxine. Is there a limit to how many benches can be <laughs> put around Rossmore? Not really. That's kind of up to you all. Um, you know, there's already quite a few in Iris Park, but um, I don't see why there can't be more. I think at some point it'll be overcrowded and we should have it in different locations, but they chose this specific location because it's important to their club. They usually meet at this spot and they meditate so it's kind of a, a main reason why they wanted this spot in particular. Okay, Mary? John, uh, you spoke of the guidelines that you use to basically assess the validity of the mm -hmm. act. Are those in writing? Are they a part of policy? How were they, how did they come into being? I think it's something that the landscape department in the past kind of outlined um, because they got so many requests to do this. Uh, it's not really... There's some boards that have wanted to put it in writing for their mutuals, but I haven't personally found anything in policy. It's just yeah. something we've been following. It, there actually is policy okay. for GRF for uh, donations to the, the community, and they come to the board for consideration. A couple of the key factors we also want to make sure is that you know, long term, is this something that we'll need to maintain? Will we need to replace it? And, and we want to make sure that it gives us latitude to move things around and, and do things. But there is, there is policy adopted. Okay, any other, uh, Joe? Um, thank you for, whoops. Thank you for the, uh, including the letter and the pictures and all of that in our packet. I didn't see the cost. Is that, is that important? <laughs> <laughs> so the club will pay for the entire cost. It's oh, about $1,800, right? So um, they're taking care of that, um, and uh, GRF's not going to be charged any. Thank you. Okay, do we have a motion? Um, I move that we approve the Mindful Living Club's request for a memorial bench at Iris Park as it's described in the materials they presented. Okay. I'll second. Mary seconded. All right, any further discussion? Uh, Deborah, roll call, please. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hart? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is a uh, revision to some machinery and equipment items. I don't see Mark Heptig, so I assume yep. maybe Jeff will take this. So Mark is uh, with the, the tour group this, this week. So this item in your 2023 capital budget under machinery and equipment, the board authorized 150000 for the purchase of a 12-foot wide mower. Uh, unfortunately, that equipment is not available. We've seen a, a good rebound in vehicles uh, for our fleet, but golf equipment is still difficult to obtain at this point, and that particular machinery is no longer in production. So they are proposing that instead uh, we replace a rough mower for 125,000 and then add a lightweight utility vehicle, which is a, a electric vehicle for less than 25,000. So the combined total would still be within the approved budget, but we're just swapping some equipment. Okay, any questions? Leanne? So the original request was for a mower, and they found a mower, and it's cheaper. Um, <clears throat> why use the whole approved amount? Why not just stick with the mower, uh, especially given the finances lately? That's certainly a, an option. One of their requests, if you recall, was a utility vehicle that was placed on, on hold. Uh, so they're proposing that uh, with the, the approved resources that they get a 
a lighter weight utility vehicle and still be within the, the approved budget. So it was something that was identified as a need before the, the adoption of the 2023 budget. But if, if the board is looking for areas of savings, that could still be deferred. Any other questions? So you know what, electric vehicle, but the mowers are not electric yet, is that correct? There are just some electric options emerging, um, not all types of, of mowers. This is not a mower that is available in, in electric, and it is very new technology that's, that's coming out in that field. So we'll be looking at that uh, certainly in, in the future. All right. Any other? Maxine? No, I, I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. All right. I move that we authorize the purchase of a rough mower and utility vehicle in place of the previously approved precision fairway mower from funds already budgeted in the trust estate fund for machinery and equipment for an amount not to exceed $150,000. Is there a second? I'll second. Mary, thank you. Any further discussion? Yeah, I have another question. So what's the purpose of the light utility vehicle? Why is that needed? So it's just a, an option for them, the crew, to get out on the course without bringing heavy equipment out there. They can transport materials to various sites uh, that otherwise they may need a, a truck for. Uh, it, it just makes their work more efficient. Mary? If we don't approve the purchase of the, light, the additional 25000 for the light utility vehicle, since that was pushed out, it gave... What would be the real hardship imposed on the workers? I don't know they classify it as a hardship. It just it, it's a tool that they use to uh, be more efficient. Um, certainly, we were intending to bring that back again in 2024 for your consideration as it was originally deferred. Um, so it would just you know continue their their current operation. Any other, dis Mary? I have a discussion, and since we are early in the year, and this year is not like prior years, savings may be important. And if it could have been deferred, then to me, deferring it seems like a good idea. As the changes in the year come, we may be able to add it. But right now, I think saying we didn't need it for sure, let's let's wait. So let's let's reduce it to the uh, purchase of the mower and and not do the utility vehicle at this time. Maxine. Are you wanting to say something? I think you're requesting that I redo the motion. Uh, yes. Yes. To exclude the purchase of the uh, utility vehicle. I'm good with that. So I will restate the motion that we're going to authorize the purchase of a rough mower and utility vehicle, et cetera, et cetera, for the not to exceed the cost of $125,000 and reserve that $25,000 to be discussed at a later date? I'll second that change. Okay. So a question, Jeff, what's the impact of that? So the, the, the impact is we would proceed with the purchase of the uh, rough mower that uh, they are recommending, and then we'll bring back the utility vehicle uh, for your consideration for 2024. Okay. All right, any other discussion? Does it have to wait till 2024 if needed, or can we bring it up later in the year? You can uh, approve additional expenses in the, the trust estate fund at any point during the year if, if that's your choice. Okay, any other discussion? If not, uh, roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Allie? Yes. Hart? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Tom Cashon is here to talk about the ongoing access control project. And I think this is a phase two issue. It is. Good morning, board. Tom Cashon, I'm your public safety manager. Uh, today I'm asking the board to authorize general manager Jeff Matheson to execute an amended contract with Securitas in an amount not to exceed $75,000 for access control phase two enhancements to be paid from the trust estate fund. And these enhancements, as was in your packet, but let me just go over them real quick, is 
installing the new OpenPath um, door access control systems that we use up at MOD. This is part of our expanding it out to the whole community. Uh, we will be installing those at Gateway, buildings A and B. I didn't know that there was A and B, but that would be where the Redwood Room is, that's one, and then where Jeff's office is, is the other one. So we'll have it in there, and then also at the Public Safety Office and at Rossmore News. We're also putting up security cameras on top of Rossmore News building. So those are the enhancements. Any questions? Leanne and Maxine. Uh, what's the need for the cameras on top of the Rossmore News building? Yeah, so this is part of this overall um, project that we're trying to do in access control is to improve the safety of the community, uh, to prevent thefts, um, be able to have some eyes on the different buildings and our assets, and to overall make the, the employees safer is what we're trying to accomplish as well. So this is how we're doing it. So we, um, they'll eventually be on every building uh, but because of budget constraints, we were only able to put them on that building. Um, we decided that that was the best one. It covers the whole building, um, and we felt that that would be the, for this one would be the right place to put them. Maxine, I, I want to be clear that I'm not criticizing or accusing anybody. I observed this morning when I was coming into the meeting an unmarked car, two gentlemen coming out and running into Gateway to use the washroom and they certainly don't want someone not to be able to use a washroom. Um, would that prevent, and they might be workers somewhere, I, I don't know, I didn't ask them, would that kind of um, equipment prevent that? So it wouldn't prevent it from happening right then, uh, but, well, I'm sorry, hang on a second. So how this system works is during our open hours, those doors would be unlocked, so it wouldn't prevent that. However, once we have cameras up, it does allow us to address it with an employee, secure toss, GRF, anybody else to say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be parking there. So we could follow up to prevent it in the future. Other questions? Neva? Just, just to clarify, Tom, uh, during the day when people use, residents use Gateway, they wouldn't have to use the access control. Correct. Okay. Correct. I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. So, so and, and just to be clear, though, um, in the past, uh, before I got here, and before COVID, too, um, residents were allowed to go back into the different offices at Gateway, where we have a lot of our employees. Um, we have changed that policy. They're not allowed to go in without approval. Um, and that those doors will be controlled um, to only allow employees to go back there. Um, granted, any of our fine people up at the front could buzz people in when they are there for a meeting and things like that. By the way, Neva, if you could speak into your microphone uh, when you, just closer to your mouth, that'd be great. Uh, Tom, uh, clarify for me. So this $75,000, an amendment to the Securitas contract or just to the access control issue? Is it an increase in the budget? Is it something we've already approved as a part of the capital budget? Yeah, good question, Dwight. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, this has already been approved. Uh, it was approved last year as part of the capital budget. Um, the money's already been approved, so that's what it's for. All right. Leanne? I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move that the board approve the amended uh, Securitas uh, Phase Two contract, not to exceed seventy-five thousand dollars from the trust estate funds. Do we have a second? I'll second. Mary is always the second because she is <laughs> on it. I like that. Any other discussion? Uh, roll call, Deborah. Certainly. Walker. Yes. Amaji. Yes. Ali. Yes. Her. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Meehan. Yes. And Topper. Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. I'd like to make a slight change in the order of the agenda here because uh, John T. has a lot of stuff going on, including mudslides and things. So, John, are you, are you prepared to uh, do your presentation now? And then we'll follow with Civility Task Force. Are you all right with that, Ted? Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, 
still going to introduce myself, even though everyone knows me, but I'm John Tauschurna. I'm our landscape manager. Um, today, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the landscaping department. Um, this presentation comes actually at a good time in, in my career here, because in a couple weeks, it'll mark my uh, year working here as the landscape manager. So, you know, I feel like I have enough experience under my belt now to really dive deep into the department and give you all some more information. So we're going to be talking about a variety of different uh, items within the department today, starting with this staff, um, our landscape contractors, uh, the irrigation controller upgrade that's currently going on, briefly on rot lawn removals and storm cleanup, um, an update on the dollar oaks, and a little bit about fire abatement because that's the season we're heading into. So, starting with our department staff, um, I'd like to start with our supervisors. Uh, Eddie Ibarra works directly underneath me. Um, he's worked here in Rossmore for 31 years. He actually started working for the GRF Trust Landscape Group as a landscape tech. Um, he's a do-it-all guy. It's really great, especially as a newer manager like myself, to have someone like him on staff. Um, I think he knows this valley probably better than the majority of anyone else here, um, from the trails to everything, he's just a really great person and very, very helpful. And he focuses with the mutuals, mostly in third mutual and the trust as well. Newest member of our staff is Jesus Morales. Um, he's a landscape supervisor. Steve Ormond, who held that position previously, just retired. Jesus comes to us from Brightview Landscapes, where I previously worked as well. He was an enhancement manager for Brightview Landscapes, um, which basically means he was involved with doing rehab projects. And he had been working in Rossmore for the past couple of years as well with Brightview, doing several projects in uh, First Mutual, Mutual 68, 61, uh, the Brightview Mutuals. Um, we're really excited to have him. He's going to bring more of a design aspect to our department, which is something I think is really important going forward. And then certainly, um, I think one of the most important members of the department is Lisa Langford. She is our landscape coordinator. I'm sure several of you, many of you have talked to her over the phone. Um, she helps assist the work order desk in a variety of tasks. She helps get all the billings and landscape pushed through. Uh, she, I call her sometimes our trash wizard because she's so helpful, you know, and she works directly with Republic Services and making sure all the trash pickups are scheduled and completed on time. Um, she, she does it all in the office. She's very, very helpful and uh, a pleasure to talk to on the phone. John, just because I don't know, can you explain what TWCM and SWCM stand for? Yes, those are mutuals. So TWCM is third Walnut Creek Mutual, and SWCM is second Walnut Creek Mutual. Moving on to other members of the staff, I first want to talk about MOD landscaping, which is Department 620. Um, in this department, one of our group of employees is our irrigation techs. They're headed by Adon Marino, and he has six techs underneath him. Uh, these techs have different areas of Rossmore that they're responsible for. Uh, when you call in a leak to the work order desk, they're usually the ones that go out there and respond to those repairs. Uh, they do a great job of doing irrigation inspections as well. So that's when they go around testing each of the valves and making sure that we're not wasting any water, making any adjustments. Um, they're responsible for all the mutuals except First Mutual 61 and 68. Um, Brightview actually handles the irrigation in those. Next is our rehab crews. We have three rehab crews uh, and three foremen, Florante Mora, Carlos Miro, and Raul Placencia. Uh, similar to the irrigation techs, they have different areas that they work in. Um, they're responsible for the infamous MOD days that you all hear about. Um, Carlos and Florante respond to a variety of different mutuals. And um, 
they kind of move through the year doing tasks. In the spring, we like to mulch. In the summer, we like to do irrigation inspections and sort of irrigation upgrades with those crews. And then in the fall, we like to do plant replacements or just planting projects in general. Um, they're kind of do-it-at-all rehab crews. And Jesus Morales, he's going to be helping a lot with those. Quick, quick question. When you talk about rehab projects, are you talking about taking lawn and completely redoing it into a drought tolerant? Yes, okay. right. totally. That, that's an example of one. Another is the juniper removal projects. Um, another is erosion controls when we plant a hillside. You know, they're out there doing that work, um, as, lo as well as the contractors here on site as well. And John, just to follow up on that, so this is all non-golf course work, is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Completely separate. They have their own separate staff. And, and, and those rehab crews only work in the mutuals as well, too. And so some of the uh, drought management uh, projects on golf course area, are, are, is your department involved in that coming up? I have been asked to have a role, but um, so far I have not had any um, impact yet. But. Oh, there's been mud holding that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had a few things that gotten in the way. Yes. <laughs> um, moving on, the last member of our MOD uh, landscape staff is Christopher Snowden. He is a pest control tech. Um, he works on a schedule. You call the work order desk. If you have pest issues, they schedule a time for him to come out. He sets traps um, and he helps get rid of those nasty critters, you know, that affect all everyone here in Rossmore because we live out in nature, basically. What well, I live in first Mutual. Mm -hmm. We have pests. Does somebody else take care of them? <laughs> yes, you're correct. So First Mutual is one of the only mutuals that has Perry. Uh, he comes out. He's this contractor that works for us. Similar to Chris, he's on a schedule. Um, and I'm sure you've probably met Perry at, at some point in time if you schedule an appointment, but he's a very nice man as well. Now, the other ha half of landscaping that is within GRF is the trust landscape, which is Department 474. Uh, this group is responsible for the clubhouses, the open space areas, everything that's not the golf course on GRF land, they help maintain. Um, the foreman is Pedro Carrillo. Uh, he's a, he's a do-it-all guy. Um, Really, really great employee for us, and you've probably seen this group of people out, whether they're pruning the annuals or touching up the annuals, whether they're uh, blowing off the pickleball courts or maintaining the tennis courts, the dog park. They do a variety of different tasks that really help bring all of our public open space areas together. And here's a picture of the staff. Um, I'd like to put some faces for you also. You know, they're a lovely group of people. When you see them out there, thank them for the work they do. I do constantly because their hard work helps make the, keep this place beautiful and, uh, you know, helps improve it. John, so, go ahead. And please say thank you to them because when you're walking around and they're blowing off leaves or other things, they always stop the noise so that you can pass peaceably. So please say thank you for that. Appreciate it. The other half, uh, oh, yes, go ahead. John, we're in Second Mutual, we are told that we have two landscape techs assigned to us. Yeah. Where do they fit on this? So underneath the rehab crews, um, it would be Raul Placencia, his crew. Um, there's two of them there, Raul and Jose. They're the ones that work. They're, they're very unique in the sense that they only work in Second Mutual. Thank you. Um, the other half of landscape maintenance here is our contractors. Um, we have two landscape maintenance contractors uh, Brightview and Terra Landscapes. Uh, you can see on my presentation there, there's sort of jur jurisdictions within the mutuals. Um, they complete a variety of landscape tasks, whether it's pruning, 
lawn, uh, lawn mowing, uh, shrub pruning, you know, fertilizing plants, um, and, and it, they had certain specifications within their, their contracts that they're held to. It's a general Rossmore specs guide that we have provided, um, and it goes into detail of what exactly they're held to their contract. Uh, they they uh, respond to work orders in a timely manner, and when you call the work order desk in a mutual, you get, often get someone from one of these companies coming out to help landscape-related tasks. Hey, John, just like every organization around the world actually had problems hiring uh, in COVID and post-COVID, are you finding the landscape contractors are, have the staff and right expertise at this point? I think it's getting better within the past six months. Uh, there was a, a huge struggle, especially when I was at Brightview, when COVID first started. We had a lot of employees quit and just go on unemployment. It was really hard to find people and hard to find good people. But I have seen a change in the past six months. I have seen it getting better and easier to hire. And with my own hirings here, working as the landscape manager, you know, I've been seeing way more applications when positions opened up than I was, you know, two years ago looking for jobs. So okay, good. I think it's getting better. But Moving on to the other half is the tree maintenance. Uh, so we have a, a several different tree maintenance contractors that work here in Rossmore. Uh, the two big ones right now are Warner Tree Care and Hamilton Tree Care. Warner has been working here for a long, long time. Uh, Ed is the founder of that company. I actually, Paul might know. I don't know how long they, they've been working. 25 years. So... They, they know this place inside and out. They, they know our, our trees better than, you know, anyone else, in my opinion. And so that's why we trust them to work pretty much everywhere in Rossmore. Um, they focus on all the pruning, the general pruning. If a resident calls into the desk saying, hey, I'm worried about my, this tree leaning, or I really think some limbs should be pruned up over my building, we give it to uh, Brian Fulkerson, who's on their staff, and he goes out and makes an assessment. Very qualified arborist, very good guy. Um, but Hamilton's been getting more involved because they have some incredible uh, tree removal equipment. They have this very large crane, which I'm sure some of you have seen. Um, they, most impref Impressively, last year I saw them remove three redwoods up in Mutual, four very large redwoods tucked between two buildings that were kind of in a tricky spot to get to. Normally that kind of work would take three to four days. They did it in one day's of work. So that's really why they're, we're getting them involved because they can take care of this larger work that Warner doesn't have the equipment to do so. Any questions about tree mates? Go ahead, Maxine. Um, if a resident observes a problem, do they send that request to the work order desk or directly to you? That's one part of my question. And the second, when I look out my window, there's some level ends that have trees within their um, little front yard, and they're really unruly. Mm -hmm. Whose responsibility is that? Um, to answer the first question, yes, call the work order desk. Work order, okay. And um, it, it'll be Lisa often that, that gets the email or the phone call, and she'll provide a notice okay. to, a work order to uh, Warner to go take a look at it. Sometimes I'll go and look at it myself, or Eddie and Jesus, my supervisors, they can sort of make judgment calls. Um, as far as the other half of your question, um, inside the patio area, it, that is going to be resident responsibility. And, um, you know, oftentimes when I'm doing tree walks with the, the different mutuals, we get into a discussion of, is this our tree? Is this our tree? And really the way we do it is we find the property line and where the base of the trunk is, right? So that, that is who, where we determine whose responsibility the work is for that tree. Sometimes mutuals will come together and sort of help each other out. Um, but there, there's some pointing fingers at times. So moving on. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, one question about the trees. If a tree is leaning, how is it determined how important it is to take it out at one time? A uh, case, you know, point in uh, that's happening right now on <clears throat> hole seven of the golf course right on Rossmore Parkway, there's a tree that's flagged and it's leaning against another tree. Mm -hmm. And there's cones on the ground and it's flagged, but I'm not sure that anybody knows what that means. And a lot of times, like when I pull up there with my golf cart, I pull way past it. But I was golfing with some guys the other day and they says, why do they always have these cones out here? And his cart was right in line with the tree leaning like this over the top of them, and I just, I don't, I just don't think people see it. Is okay. is, but is there is there, um, uh, is that not like a sense of urgency? They know it's leaning, but it's not something that's going to come down, right? You know, I mean, we had some really gusty winds the other day, and I was thinking about that. So great question. Um, part of an arborist certification is risk assessment. Mm. So. Um, that when you're trying to pass for those like that test, you need to be able to take into certain site specifications, look at an area, and determine whether this tree is a serious risk, right? Um, oftentimes, in low-risk areas, we'll flag trees, you know, with caution tape that are set to be removed, but they're not an immediate danger. Um, I'll talk about... I, I, I can't reference the golf course because I don't know the specifics of the tree you're talking about, but I can talk about one recently um, in uh, by the Dollar Clubhouse during the storms. We had a, a pine tree that we ended up having to remove because it had some very significant lean to it. Um, you know, that tree was standing straight up and down all through the summer. You You get there. Um, after the storms, very saturated soil, winds, it started to lean. And Brian from Warner is actually the one that pointed it out. It wasn't someone from our staff. He drives around, he finds these things. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> he's got quite the eye for it. He's been doing it for a while. So, you know, something like that, we marked it. We then clear the area, put caution tape all around so we make sure no one's going in that area. But if, if there isn't um, any caution tape to prevent you know, a resident from walking in that area, that means it's not a danger. I would not be worried about it. Does that answer your question? Well, there is caution tape on it. You know, okay. That's what I, I am, but I've been, I've been, it's been three weeks now that I've been looking at this tree and I'm just thinking, well, you yeah. know, I, I, I assume it's not that, it's not that dangerous. Right. The, the ground's not lifting, it's just, but the tree is over. Yeah. So, I, I'd love to have an answer for every single <laughs> instance, but I don't for this one. Um, anything else on tree maintenance before I move on? Nope. Okay. So next thing I'm going to talk about is the irrigation controller upgrade. Uh, this is with our controller contractor, ET Water. They were actually purchased by Jane recently. Uh, Jane usually works in agriculture irrigation, um, but they are a huge, huge player in the industry. Um, so it was a big purchase for them, and they've made some changes clearly over the past few years. So we have entered into a new all-encompassing contract with ET Water. Um, previously in Rossmore, all of your controllers were maintained individually by the mutuals. So when a controller would break, we would then ask ET Water to send us an estimate to fix that controller, and then it would need board approval, and they were always approved because it's completely necessary. And um, you know they would then pay the cost, come out and replace it. Uh, other things in the past, each of these controllers operated on a five-year subscription fee. Uh, that's to keep it running because there's a SIM card in the controller. It needs to be able to connect to the satellites in the sky. So. Um, they would actually have to pay up front for that fee. Now, in this new contract, we pay them a certain amount per month, and they handle all of it for us. Um, it's in their contract to res respond to our emergencies within 48 hours. Um, you know, they, at this point, they own the controllers. So when they break, if they have to do upgrades, it's all on them to take care of it. 
Um, so going into some more detail, we broke down the cost of this um, by the number of controllers per mutual, and there's a few in trust as well. So uh, it ended up being around $32 per controller to keep this going. And when I did the math for on a per manner basis or all Rossmore, it's only going to be about two cents per manner to keep this system going. Um, it's an extensive system of 404 controllers, so I think that's a great price to, to keep it running and to help us save water. But right now, we're in a true-up phase with them. We're paying a little bit more per month because we have so many older model controllers in Rossmore. Um, there's been a big change out of 2G controllers because they don't operate on this new system that they're providing us. Um, we actually have to take off the old box and install a completely new box, which in the past that would have been close to $2,000. Um, but now since our contract, they're just moving through about 105 of these and uh, replacing them as they go. Um, other details right now during the true-up phase is that all the other 300 controllers need an actual modem upgrade. Um, this allows it to be on the new system. It's a very simple switch. It only takes about five minutes. And it's... Um, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> It, it, John, we call that a Rossmore moment. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me ask, let me ask you a question while you gather Go ahead. thought. Oh, I lost my train of thought. No. <laughs> so these new controllers, what, what do they do? It's, it's more efficient use of water, or it's, it's, uh, they don't break down as much, or I hope their weather balloons didn't get shot down by the, the U.S. government. <laughs> no, it's, it's basically... In order to get us on the new platform, they have to upgrade some certain things, right? So the modems are for the other general controllers. The other issue, right, is we're losing 3G service. Um, you know, 2G is sticking around for the time being, but we don't want to be sitting here with 2G controllers when that comes. So as AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, as they, you know, sort of upgrade uh, their service, we have to do that as well with this system. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. I wish there was ways to communicate the satellites. I wish they just kept 3G going, but uh, it's something that we have to adapt with as we move through it. Um, but, but the bottom line of that is to efficient use of water? Right. Okay. The goal of this all is to save water, right? And the, sort of the next slides that I'm going to go over outlines the new platform that we're on to um, and, you know, the benefits to it because the old platform is outdated. It was something that was created in the early 2000s. So, um, and the last sort of touch on this true up phase is that we're supposed to be completed by April 1st this year. Um, all controllers will be on the new platform, fully operational. And, um, you know, I look forward to that date because there's been some, some issues as we've moved through it controllers not working because uh, they're no longer connecting to the satellites, right? So just giving a little bit of background about this new platform, uh, this is what it looks like. This is actually a summary page for one of the controllers. Um, it's, you can see on there that there's seven valves. Um, we each have, we have data inputted for each of these valves whether they're a lawn station, shrub station, you can see fescue on there as well. Um, and then the computer takes that data and actually uh, creates an irrigation schedule for it, which is what you see on the, the uh, right-hand side. Um, I want to preface that even though it says February 16th that there's going to be watering, I just unsuspended this controller just for this example. It's suspended right now. We're not doing any watering. But I did want to show this page to kind of give you all an idea of what I'm looking at on my end and how I adjust things. So um, moving forward, this is a new page that the old system didn't have. Uh, it's a very simple way to adjust the frequency of irrigation and the time of irrigation. 
Frequency is the number of days in a week or month, however you want to do it. Um, and we like in Rossmore to operate at a higher frequency. So that doesn't mean we're watering, you know, twice as much. It just means instead of four days, instead of two days a week, we're watering four days a week for short, shorter periods of time. We do that because of our clay soils here. Um, you know, our, our soil drains out so fast of moisture. So adding more water more frequent is a better thing. Um, and then the other side of the page, the right side there, is um, the how long the stations run. We usually operate at 100% here in Rossmore. That means we're trying to uh, water for what the controller is calculating for the appropriate amount of time. And, um, you know, sometimes I will go to mutuals and say, would you like me to de decrease this? Um, it might put plants in harm, but uh, if you're trying to save money, we can go down to a 75%, 70 80%, whatever they think is necessary. Um, and this, this page just basically gives an outline of the different data that these controllers are connecting. This is weather data, data for rain, wind, uh, ET for this area. Controllers take in that information and automatically will change the time and number of days as they move through the year. Uh, it's very cool for someone. Gosh, there's probably around 5,000 irrigation valves in Rossmore. I couldn't imagine spending all that time trying to do this for every single valve, so it's great that we have a system that does it for us. Um, here's some more data that it takes in on a daily basis. And then this last page is an important page for someone like me in the industry. Um, this is soil moisture depletion. Uh, basically, it's just looking at a plant or, or the actual station, right, and seeing whether there's enough moisture in the ground for that plant at that time. Uh, it takes you know, all the data we've inputted, and uh, you can see Right now, the controller's estimating that five out of the seven stations are in good shape. If they have enough water, they're in the green. And then those other two, you know, they're a little bit lower. We might need to add some water there. And so we can use this information to sort of fine tune our irrigation system. And does anyone have any questions on the controllers before I move on? Go ahead, Neva. So the does the controller measure how much water is in the soil? No. So they can do that, but you need to install soil moisture sensors, sensors at a variety of different locations to do that. We have them just calculate it themselves given how much they're watering, and it takes in you know, the weather data to sort of give that estimate, um, you know, I think the best way to use that page that I just showed, um, I can go back to it, is to see the stations in red and to send a tech out to see, hey, do the plants look dry? Do we think we need more water? Or is, you know, are we okay? Does that make sense? Uh, well, what's telling you that, the, um, that these two red stations don't have enough water? So you'll see a number on those. Um, that it's, it's typically out of 100. So if, you're, if your moisture's at 100%, then you know, there's plenty of water there for the plants. But as it gets lower and lower, right, um, the soil gets drier and drier. And if you start getting into the 50, 40, 30 percentiles, you know, you're really going to start to see the material suffer, the plant material. Okay, moving on. So while we're on the subject of water, I think a good segue is just talking briefly about lawn removals. I've already done a presentation on this, but I kind of want to give an update on the work that we're doing. Um, so in 2022, I estimated that the mutuals and GRF all combined removed 115,000 square foot of lawn. That's about two football fields, um, if you could put it in your head. That's kind of the best comparison I like to do when I think about lawn. And 
My estimated savings for that removal is about 1.7 million gallons of water per year, which um, is a considerable amount. This is why we're doing the lawn removals, uh, because it is the most effective way for us to save water going forward. And we're going to continue doing this. Go ahead. Do you find the mutuals are reaching out to you for grass areas that they want to uh, help control their water usage? Yes. Um, I would say right now the leaders are second mutual and first mutual. They have the most amount of lawn. Um, and uh, they're, doing a, they're doing a great job at really making this a focus. Um, you know, with the smaller mutuals, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, there's still people that are trying to hold on to the lawn that they have left, and I understand that. But um, I'd say the majority of the smaller independent mutuals, they're focusing on the small little strips of lawn that are really quite pointless. Um, you're not walking on them. You're not having a picnic. Non-functional turf, we've heard this term been thrown around quite a bit. You know. Really, every mutual is actually tackling those. So we're doing a good job of th thinking about it. John, within a GRF property, how much non-functional turf is left? I, on GRF land, I would consider the medians. Um, that is really what we have left. Uh, on the top of my head, I want to say about that's about... 60 to 70,000 square feet of lawn that remains. Uh, the previous section that we did was 18,000. Um, you know, that's really the next focus. And then that strip outside the gate um, to, the, uh, to the right as you drive in, um, that, that's one that we probably need to get rid of as well as non-functional turn. How much of that is GRF property? All the way to Savers? I need to double check on that, but I, I, I could get back to you on that one. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know that. Yeah, thank you. I don't know. Anyone else? Okay, moving on uh, to storm cleanup. I actually referenced this pine tree earlier uh, when we were talking about tree maintenance. This is the one that we noticed was leaning and had to be removed. We had several trees that fell or were leaning like this, uh, 21 in total throughout Rossmore during the January storms. Actually had a couple uh, yesterday as well, so I guess the total's up to 23 right now. Um, this is for all the mutuals and GRF, but not including the golf course. I'm not sure about the actual numbers there. Uh, tree crews from Warner and Hamilton were you know, ready to go around the clock to answer to these calls. Um, they, they were super helpful, uh, very responsive, very happy with the way they performed. Um, and the estimated cost for all this work uh, was about $23,000. Maxine, you had a question? I, I'm sure you've said this before, but just to clarify for residents, are there rules that when a tree falls, it's replaced? How, how does that system work of the number of trees in Rossmore? So it depends. Um, it, at the end of the day, it's up to the mutual, right? Okay. Um, if they want to do that, I would say the majority of mutuals are of that opinion. But we will sometimes get in a situation where um, we have to remove trees, and it should not, it's not appropriate location to have a tree again, right? Um, that I often think about small areas where trees are, the roots are harming the building or the lifting up the sidewalk. You know, we're not going to replace those, right? Um, but yes, where it's appropriate, we will be replacing. Here's another part of the uh, storm cleanup was our mudslides. Uh, the ones shown here are up along Sackland Indian, and then another one that is the big one that uh, actually went down onto the golf course in some of Rossmore Parkway Entry 3. Um, crews were responding to these slides, and they completed immediate cleanup of the roads and entryways. Um, we're still cleaning up a lot of these slides. I had my crew the past few days working 
along Terra California and the actual Sacklin Indian slides that you can see in the photos right there. Um, in some areas, right on the slide, we've been installing jute netting. If you want to see what that looks like, I recommend driving up Terra California right now. You can see we did it on the actual slide, and I got a native uh, erosion control seed mix for the crews to actually spread on those areas as well. I mixed a little bit of native wildflowers in there too to, to give it a nice pretty look too. So um, that's kind of been our main approach to tackling a lot of these sides in the landscaping department. Uh, Martin Lemons, he has been in charge of sort of doing the, the bigger work, um, getting proposals from companies to actually do for, for big slides like Rossmore Parkway Entry 3 or Oakmont Entry 16 had a retaining wall that collapsed, that type of stuff. So, um, The last little bit of the storm cleanup that you know is still going on as well is cleaning up our drainage. Um, during the atmospheric rains, all the silts from the hillsides came down at once and it really clogged up the system. Um, you know, most notably in my memory was between Terra Granada entries eight and nine. Um, we had that area, the road was completely flooded. You can see where that crew from five star is standing. Um, you know, we weren't letting traffic through. They were there for uh, many, many hours trying to get that drain cleaned. You can see they're using a little, um, a tool that actually jets, it blows really fast water through it to clean those drains, the sort of the large storm drains. They'll actually push through the mud, and then once it's open a little bit, the rest of it will all start to drain through. Um, you know, I, I do think going forward, some of these larger drains need to be looked at uh, for, for better solutions because, um, you know, <laughs> at least make them easier to clean out. Um, I think that's, a, that's an issue that we need to focus on in the future and try to tackle some of these larger storm drains because, um, you know, just make it easier for at least my maintenance crew to come clean it out and make sure that we're not flooding any streets or, or nearby entries. John, do you see that as preventative work or reactionary work? I see it as preventative. Um, you know, a lot of these, uh, all these drains were engineered when they were first installed. And, you know, the type of rain that we got is not often, right? So um, it's, it's rare that all of the drains will be as backed up as they were during the storm. I'm talking about the areas that we know consistently have issues, right? Um, I think Terra Granada, this one in particular, like Fairlawn Entry 5 comes to mind. Oakmont entry 12 comes to mind. You know, those three are, are big, big issues that, you know, we constantly see throughout the storms. And I've only been here for so long, but I've seen it twice now in a row, consecutive years. So those are the ones I'm really talking about uh, when, when it comes to this kind of work. And then as far as the snaking of small uh, ground drains within the mutuals, we had a, a couple different times where crews were working after hours. Um, during one of the atmospheric rains, I was here with the crew till nine o'clock. We were getting calls from Securitas going out and helping residents, you know, clear small drains by the unit. Uh, the sandbag station was really crucial. Um, you know, we had staff there helping out the residents during the day. I think that was a really good thing we did this year and it's something that we should probably continue in years going forward. Okay, any other questions on storms before I go on? All right, the Dollar Oaks. So, um, since we last talked about these trees, um, Evergreen Tree Care, this kind of a specialty tree care that we got involved for this, uh, came out and completed the air spading around the bases of the trees where it was necessary. Uh, they also did some minor pruning of these trees to sort of lighten the limbs uh, that were heavy and prone to failure. Um, they completed this work back in October. Um, I was really happy with the work they did. The air spade is a very cool tool. 
Um, it really prevents the trees from getting damaged, and it is amazing how fast they're able to trench with that thing. And I'm sure a lot of you went down there and saw the holes that um, you know they they created, and it's it's pretty clear that um, the bases of these trees were a bit buried, um, and it's something that needed to be done. Um, the only note I have from Hamilton is we did lose tree number 16. It was the one I outlined in my report as the, um, the biggest concern and the bis biggest risk. We had Joe McNeil, a master arborist, come out and take a look at the tree. Uh, we've had many different arborists try to help with that tree in the past. I know my predecessor even had someone out to burn it, which is a special maintenance technique that you can do sometimes to sort of revive an older coast live oak tree. I wasn't here, but from what I've heard from my staff is that it did work for a little while, for a couple of years, but that tree continued to decline and decline, and there was no saving it. It got to a point where it was a risk to, you know, resident safety, so unfortunately it had to come out. And lastly, I just want to touch on what the trust landscape crew just did. So they completed, when the soil was soft, some minor grading around the basis of the trees. I've had some people already reach out and say, well, why'd you fill in the holes? <laughs> What's going on with the trees? And we did not fill in the holes. We, um, we, we simply just graded away from them. You know, now the base of the trunk where the base of the hole was is now just leveled ground. Um, there's actually two trees where we were unable to do this. I'll touch on them briefly here in a second. But, um, you know, the, the other thing the trust crew did was mulch around the bases of the trees. This is good. We used our mulch we use everywhere. Uh, it'll provide some nutrients for the trees. Um, it'll help uh, do some moisture retention at this period in time. Uh, before the actual roots go dormant during the summer. Uh, lastly, they still have a little bit of more work to do uh, on trees 12 through 15. Those trees are located um, by the actual picnic area um, where I believe the Rotary Club meets. You know, People often go there after playing a round of golf to relax, hang out with friends. Um, we're actually going to create an area for those trees around the base of them with a small fence uh, to sort of keep foot traffic, golf cart traffic out of those areas um, and to keep people away um, from the tree because the more compaction, the harder it is for the tree to breathe, basically. So moving on to the two trees I referenced. This is tree number eight. It is located right next to the dumpster area. Um, and uh, we completed the air spanning here, and you can see from that photo on the right that I had to go about a foot and a half down to get to the base of the tree. This makes it a kind of a hazard at this point, and um, we can't grade around it because there will still be a drop from the asphalt to the base of the tree. So, you know, I am recommending that we remove a small section of asphalt here. Um, Unfortunately, I need to get with some with Martine and determine whether it's enough asphalt to have to move this dumpster area. Um, it's something that I'm working on currently, but this tree I do believe is enough of an asset to where I think it's important for us to, to make the necessary uh, movements on the asphalt. Does anyone have any questions about that? Now, tree number 11 is, in, in my opinion, I think the most unfortunate location of all these large oak trees. Uh, you can see it's kind of pinned at the back of the parking lot area between the golf cart pathway and our uh, parking lot. Um, it has much, like a large amount of decay at the base of the trunk, um, something that we didn't see before the air spading. Uh, but you can see in that photo on the left side there where that decay is. You can go take a look right now, too. I do not think this, this tree is going to survive for much longer. It's still putting out new shoots of growth. 
So it's, we're not in an immediate uh, situation where we have to remove this tree right now. But I don't think the right thing to do here is to actually remove the cart path and the asphalt because at some point this tree will fail due to this decay at the bottom. Um, the air spade has created a tripping hazard. We have it coned off right now. But oh, my recommendation for the time being is we fill this air spading back in and we just see how the tree performs, continually check on it over the next few years. What's the average lifespan of a valley oak? They can live for a long, long time. Um, average lifespan is around, you know, if they're in an open space area, 300 to 500 years. Um, they can live for quite a while. The majority of trees we're talking about here are about that age. Um, they're in the lower 200s to lower 300 years old. Um, you know, one thing that I had to remind people is that although Rossmore is in a nature environment, it is an urban environment technically, right? These trees are put into stress no matter how much work you do to engineer around them when you install a pavement or whatever. Um, buildings, variety of different reasons, you know, they do best when they're just left alone in the open space. So it, it, it's great that they have lasted this long and we want to keep making their lifespan longer, which is why we're doing these things. But it's important to note that they're under stress. Um, how old are the oldest ones that we have here? I know the Garden Club has one that's at least two or three times bigger than the ones around Dollar. Um, I've been out to that tree. I haven't measured it. So the way you get its age is simply by measuring its circumference and uh, multiplying it by a factor based on the, the type of tree. I don't know how old that one is off the top of my head, but I would guess it's 350 to 400 years old. Um, very, very old tree. John, we have about five minutes left. If okay. We, if you can. Okay. I am almost done because the last subject is fire abatement. Um, fire season is fast approaching us. A lot of our work ahead in the next few months is sort of doing preventative fire maintenance. Brightview and Terra will be completing weed abatement activities in all the mutuals. The majority of that work is limbing up low-hanging branches and then they're also required in their contract to do 100 feet of uh, weed abatement within all buildings. Um, that's their busy, the biggest task for them. They also complete some pre-emergent herbicide spraying at this time, which help prevents the, the growth of weeds. Um, our tree contractors also will focus on limbing up low-hanging limbs and pruning for building clearance to sort of help prevent against fire danger. You know, we're still doing juniper removals. I'm sure you still see all of them, but Rebecca did a great job of focusing on the high priority juniper air, uh, junipers, which are within 30 feet of the building. And the overwhelming majority of those are gone. Um, we still recommend removing junipers. There is some hesitancy from some mutuals to still do this because they like the barriers that they provide, but the department itself is still recommending that we remove these junipers. And Diablo Fire Safety Council is still offering grants for these projects up to $5,000. So I highly encourage any mutuals to, to think about doing that work. Lastly, I want to note on the um, forest management plan, which you can see a image from one of the many pages in that plan. Uh, this this uh, pertains to fire abatement, this image. Um, you can see some different zones that are outlined in orange, you know, that are labeled as shaded fuel breaks. Uh, in the plan, those were identified as weakened areas and areas that are at risk to fire, right? So their recommendation is to continually create breaks in those locations. Um, I, I know you all just 
last month had a meeting with Con Fire about the work that's upcoming for them. Um, it's the good news is a lot of their grant is going to take care of creating fuel breaks in those orange areas. So, um, you know, the work that they do is going to be very beneficial to my department and we're going to help maintain those areas as we move forward. Um, you know, we have some, uh, outside contractors that are hired every year to do weed abatement in certain areas, um, specifically underneath the power lines, uh, kind of behind the garden club area. There's a specific location that gets done every year. It happens every year. It's been going on for a very long time that we help complete. And that's it. Um, a question for you, John. So there are areas that CONFIRE will not be addressing that were a part of the forest management plan. Do we have a plan for those areas? Yes. And a, a lot of it is work that my trust cr crew completes. Uh, you'll see on that map those calming zones. Mm -hmm. That's the work that we're mostly focused on. And it's, you know, you'll see them working on the areas along the roadways up into the hillsides, um, sort of just disking and making sure that it's clear of all weeds. Great. Any other questions for John? Mary? Uh, what is a calming zone? <laughs> it's, I've even had trouble getting definition for this one, so great question. Um, it's an area that doesn't need to be created as a fuel break. It's just an area that needs to be constantly maintained and looked at. Um, the fuel breaks, you know, they have to be a certain amount of feet wide and there, there really can't be any sort of shrubbery in those areas. The calming zones, you can have some shrubbery. Um, you know, you still keep the weeds down, limbs linked up, but you know, they're, they're not areas where we need a, a big break, if that makes sense. Leanne? I just want to commend you on all the work you've done. You've really done a great job. On, I've watched a lot of your projects. I especially know the importance of getting rid of those junipers. And, you know, you get rid of those things and it looks bad. But in the five or so hillsides I've seen, uh, the restoration, uh, it looks really good. And it's going to be nice. Good. Thank you. John, thanks for your presentation, and please pass along our thanks to everybody in your department for keeping Rossmore beautiful and safe and, and ready for the future. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. All right, next, and uh, we need to be mindful of our time. Moviegoers will be coming in sometime in the next 40 minutes. So, uh, Ted, Civility Task Force report. We're looking forward to this. Yeah, I mean, hopefully I won't be the, all of the 40 minutes uh, time there. But okay, that's a deal. Yeah, uh, so I'm just going to give a little brief background and a little talk about it, and it's going to be divided up between the board members that are here. Uh, the Civility Task Force was um, approved by the board, uh, GRF Board of Directors on June 30th of 2022, and the task force consists of three GRF board members, um, Maxine, <coughs> excuse me, Maxine Topper, Leanne Amaji and myself. And we also had five resident members, volunteers, uh, who uh, stepped up, who it was important to them to be part of it. And that is uh, Tom uh, Consoli, uh, Ann C Cooper, Kathleen Herdingen, Mike Parker, and we had one alternate, Barbara Gamblin. We also had a staff member, Eric Wong. He's our senior manager of human resources. And that was the committee that, or the task force that was put together for this. Uh, the Merriam um, Webster, the, the dictionary, uh, defines uncivility as rude or discourteous. Uh, it goes a little deeper than that. It's like, insult comments, harassment, um, a harsh criticism, uh, um, personal attacks, uh, explosive anger, uh, um, disrespectful or offensive manners in, in ways of speaking. And so in 20, you know, 2020 to 2022, there's a lot of different factors that cause this all to start come up. 
uh, COVID and um, uh, changed a lot of things, locked a lot of people up, uh, and it uh, uh, increased fears and tension uh, with the uh, Rossmore community. And this was not just for, not something that was just for Rossmore. It was across the nation this was happening. A lot of incivility was happening across the nation. And especially um, uh, in 2021 and 2022, uh, there was, uh, within Rossmore, uh, an increased number in um, um, difficulty with the GRF staff uh, relationships with members, uh, GRF uh, board members and Rossmore residents um, were, were giving you know, we're venting, to say, with with all of us. And um, those uh, tensions resulted in an uptick in some real negative behavior. Verbal abuse to the staff, uh, an increase in negative letters within Rossmore News in the residence form especially, uh, lack of civility uh, during uh, residence calls, um, and email exchanges between the GRF staff and the GRF board. Uh, verbal attacks um, addressed towards specific staff members and GRF board members during uh, our resident forum uh, sessions and uh, emails. Disregarding, rem uh, uh, disparaging remarks and confrontations made in person uh, between residents and residents to staff. So in, in April of 2022, uh, several uh, GRF boards felt it was compelling to start this project. And uh, so the, the GRF board suggested creating the, the Civility Task Force to research the possible reasons and, and uh, do a little deep dive on this. In addition, the GRF board made a recommendation uh, to revise the uh, residence form verbiage uh, uh, in order to clearly um, ex give an expectation of the behavior of the speakers so that when they were doing the res residence form, they could they could address everyone. And so now I'm gonna let Maxine talk a little bit on that. So we began meeting in September of 2022 uh, to work mostly on trying to promote respectful behavior between people in the community, the community and the staff, the staff back to the community, everybody that lives and works within the Rossmore community. We had six monthly public meetings, and we realized that this was a huge, large topic that wasn't going to be solved and fixed, but we certainly could make do some actions and recommend some um, pieces that might help make Rossmore a more civil, more comfortable community for all of us to live in. So what, one, of, one of the first things we did was focus on what were the causes of residents' um, incivility as well as staff concerns and um, discomfort. And of course, we were all afraid of getting COVID. Uh, we were all stuck in our homes. Many people were concerned with their own their own health, health of uh, family members around the country. We're also afraid of disasters such as fire and earthquake, unpredictability of a global pandemic. It made this type of incident caused all of us to feel more vulnerable and not be able to trust how tomorrow is going to be. Um, we were concerned about our own deteriorating health. There was some drama going on across the national pol political climate, um, increased incidences of racism. Some of us um, needed to become caregivers, and that's a concern. There was a lot of misunderstanding going on on whose role it was to 
be responsible for different things that were happening throughout the G, throughout GRF and the mutuals. Um, and people were concerned about, well, I called and nobody called me back. So they were concerned about responsiveness and weren't as tolerant as they might have been understanding the staff shortages that were going on during that time. After we looked at all those possible causes, the committee worked towards ways to address those fears and give residents more tools to help alleviate some of those concerns. Um, also tried to highlight how this climate um, manifests itself in everyday life so more of us could then understand what's going on how people are responding and perhaps become more tolerant in response to that. One of the main goals was to promote positive actions. Rather than focus on the negativity, we wanted to look at what can we do to promote more positive um, actions towards change, and we will talk later about some of those things that had a positive effect. There were lots of articles also in the Rossmore News. The, all of this is on the packet, so if those of you who want to read the whole report, it is in the assembly under this meeting. Um, we understand also that inciviz incivility on a national level is being reviewed and discussed across the nature, across the nation, so Rossmore is not alone in this area. And I think I'm done. Moving it on to <laughs> Leanne. What was the So um, it was a big topic, like the Ted and Maxine said. So we tried to launch some discovery. We um, looked at different departments within Rossmore and how the incivility had affected them and, to, and got feedback from uh, Eric Wong and Ann Peterson with the news and Paul Donner with his MOD staff. And... Um, and then Penny in the counseling center, too, to uh, give us more of a human suffering kind of feeling or, or analysis of what happened during COVID and the pan pandemic. And so that helped us decide um, or determine what some of the causes were. And we felt that was important because you can't make a recommendation until you know some of the causes. So we tried to boil that down. And then we also um, did a staff survey of some of the MOD employees to get their feedback. And um, some of the causes we realized, most of the causes we felt were related to a lack of or insufficient communication. So... Um, our, the, in the accomplishments and the recommendations, we're, we're presenting things that we think will improve the communication. So we published, I think, seven articles in the Rossmore News. We tried to keep them positive. We tried to, you know, guide residents as to, um, you know, how can you improve civility yourself? And how, what's the impact of what your actions are on other people? And just to try to create some sort of um, empathy, in a way, of others. So um, that was one way of trying to, by communicating through the articles, to spread that message of how we can rise above in civility. Um, and then within the recommendations, uh, we wanted to highlight basically five different things that um, we want the board to do and future boards to do, and that's to continue that process of um, imp enhancing communication and enhancing um, civic civil behavior, and that involves maybe rotating the articles that have already been produced over the course of years. And at the Rossmore News has said that she can do that in different ways. And so we think that would be a big plus, just to keep the topic of civility um, at the top of people's minds and, and have them recognize that it's needed. Um, we also encourage the Rossmore News and staff to highlight GRF departments. Um, they're already doing that. And that, we hope, will create better communication between residents and staff so that by um, 
personalizing staff a little bit more so that we're all, there's a realization that we're all part of the same community. Um, um, also, we think there's a way to use different examples of posters or flyers that we've put in here. They need modification, but basically it's a dra these are drafts of things that we think might have people think more about civility. So maybe we can put them in the bulletin board in the gateway hallway. Um, a lot of people reference that bulletin board. Maybe it'll just be another way to message out that um, keep your mind on civility. Um, and again, you can look at those examples in the uh, packet. Um, and then one of the big things about communication is defining the responsibilities between mutuals and GRF. And there are multiple ways that um, we've drafted that we think will do that. Um, we've even expanded that idea um, to creating a contact chart on My Rossmore so that with a simple click, residents can connect with that phone number or email of a department that they need versus having to go through Rossmore News, or I mean, I'm sorry, Rossmore.com or the phone book to look through. You know, maybe we can make it easier, or for the people that are more comfortable with online work, they can just tap on something and, and get that contact that they need. Versus um, sometimes now we found through uh, interviews that people get extremely frustrated not being able to get the right person for the action that they need. So um, look at those in our packet. Um, we really think that using the bulletin board in the gateway hallway uh, the, near the Redwood Room is a good way to um, keep current on promoting civility. Now, if you think about that um, case that was put up for the mutual agendas just outside the counseling center, um, that's very helpful for people. And so I think if we had a section of that gateway bulletin board um, that people knew, you know, had gateway information, maybe announcements about agenda meetings or, I mean, about board meetings or these flyers about civility, um, it would be a go-to place for GRF, just like we have a go-to place for the mutual information. Um, so there are a million other things <laughs> we would like to do as a civility task force, but um, we have no power. So we need the board to look at the recommendations we need them to um, take civility seriously just to ward off any other possible phases of incivility that we experience in the future. Just keep it current. Um, we don't expect the board or future boards to do all these things, but maybe pick and choose as things come up and see what's practical. Uh, most of these things are not expensive, um, and they could probably have a, an impact. So um, the goal is keep civility in the forefront, provide information to residents in many different ways to appeal to people who access refer uh, materials differently, um, and keep the communication open between staff and residents, and um, post information that, that it, that's helpful, not just online, but hard copy, visible. Um, just try to hit all the different angles of, exp of uh, providing information to the community. Um, and that's about it. It's a big job. So first of all, I want to thank all the members of the task force and, and you three for your good work on this. It's a lot of work over six months to try to um, herd cats and, <laughs> and, and, and capture mercury, moving mercury. If there was one thing, just give me one thing that you think will make a difference, what should we do immediately? One thing. I, well, I think you're going to get three. <laughs> three, but uh, one thing that, that came up, um, both in the meeting and on the outside, because starting the Civility Task Force, we got asked questions all of us got asked questions on the outside too because people wanted to know about what is going on and everything. Um, they they want to be heard when they when they need something, but the 
problem is, is it seems to be difficult to find out how to get to the person to give them what they need to hear. And uh, that was part of what Leanne was talking about, an, a, a chart, a one-click thing to be able to get to the person that you want to get to. I know that I helped a number of people during the course of this six months who approached me and says, you know, I know you're on this committee, and you, you uh, but I got this problem. And they were going through it all in the wrong direction to get what they wanted to get done. And when I explained, here's who you should call to get that done, the next time I saw them or within the next day that I saw them, they says, I can't believe it. I got an answer back and they got a meeting and they're coming out to see me. So I think for me, the one thing that seems to drive people to be uncivil is not knowing. And it can be as simple as not knowing what's a mutual problem and what's a GRF problem. It's, it, I mean, there's, that, it encumbrances all of that. But it's a, a project on the house. How do I get, you know, who do I call? I got this problem. Who do I call to get this done? Um, and I think that that was a so, really big piece. So, so that's, that's a good idea. And is there something within my Rossmore where we could do like FAQs? Like, I have rats. What do I do? <laughs> and and here, here's the contact and blah, blah, blah. That's one of the things we've been discussing is how to build that FAQ and make sure it's all encompassing. So not only can residents find that within my Rossmore, but it's a resource for uh, the departments as well that, that may get that phone call from a, a resident and it's not in their area. Well, instead of just redirecting them, they can easily identify that as well. So hopefully it's a, a tool that both residents and staff could use, but that'll definitely take a little bit to, to develop. Okay, so that's the one thing. Uh, so, oh, there's more. Oh, 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 oh. I would just say, if you want an immediate thing to address that issue, and I think we heard from most people that that was the, that was the confusion. They're attacking, you know, GRF for not doing something when actually it was a mutual responsibility. So for an immediate thing to do, publish a chart. There are examples in the packet. Publish a chart, put it up in that bulletin board, and draw attention to it in the Rossmore News also to let just repeat that over and over and over again so that people start to understand the differences of a responsibility. And not to get nitty gritty, but we, we should use every medium that's available to us. No, it should, news, but you're talking about media. The My Rossmore project Rossmore. would be down but the But you road. could do it the same thing all at the same time, really. But all right. Our okay. fastest, right. our fastest it's response. My turn. I, <laughs> after you. I think one of the main things that came out of this that I would love to see encouraged is and continued is the awareness, the articles. I really believe that the difference comes from Peace Book begins with me. That there has been more of kindness that I've seen and the more each and every one of us displays kindness towards those around us, that will spread and that will balance those few moments of incivility that come across our way. Done. <laughs> I, I'm not sure the board can mandate that, but... Yeah. No, but you can do it. <laughs> and I appreciate all of you. I, I feel like the most effective tool that uh, that uh, uh, Civility Task Force had was the newspaper. Uh, the articles we put in the newspaper um, were very general types of way to respect each other and to understand people's opinions and and know that that is that is their opinion and it's not necessarily wrong but you might have another opinion and a different approach to way to, to talk that out. And the newspaper, I think, is, was the best tool that has helped us move forward. And, and I think that we should continue utilizing some of the information we had in the packet to move, keep the board moving forward with that information uh, so that this doesn't go away. The civ civility thing doesn't go away. That's in, in just to that point, when we ended our meeting, at least half of the meeting was wondering what happens now? What, what's gonna keep this going? So that's another piece that we'd have to look at. 
Leanne is going to say, oh, I've heard this before, but there is, and you guys reference it here, uh, Encourage Community Foundation has a marketing campaign that I think is extremely clever. And it says, speak your piece, P-E-A-C-E, and it's a poster uh, marketing campaign. I've seen it in other communities. It's on their homepage on their website. It's a part of their agenda packet for every committee and board meeting so that people get the message over and over again, which is what you guys are talking about. How do you keep that alive? But I think you have to do it in a clever way. You know, not, don't be uncivil, you know, <laughs> uncivil. I don't know, where's Ann? But do, you, uh, do you think we acted that way? We didn't act that way. I don't think we, we presented that to people. I think we presented the information in a very positive manner. Are you, are you, are you getting uncivil with me right now? <laughs> no, no, I agree. No, I just think it's, it speaks to what you guys are trying to do, and that's a marketing campaign that's ongoing and pervasive uh, within all of our communication tools, whether it's bulletin boards, newspaper, right. assembly, agenda packets, whatever, my Ross Moore. Um, so I applaud your efforts. It is never ending. <laughs> and we have to be civil ourselves, you're right. We have to set the example, uh, but really appreciate all the work that was done. Jeff, do you wanna add something? It looks like you're ready. Did I have that look? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First, just uh, uh, really commend the board and the, the task force. What a difficult topic to re examine and reflect on. Um, you're, you're talking about human behavior and to do that in a manner that doesn't get defensive and accusatory is, is challenging. So just the mere uh, topic and, and conversation, I think, brought about some awareness and, and change. So, uh, But there are definitely within the, the recommendations some initiatives that, uh, from a staff perspective, we'll take back, digest, and be able to bring those forward to you for, for your reflection and, and consideration, whether it be communication tools, messaging and so forth, we'll take those as, as some mandates to, to really bring back, uh, to keep it in front of you. Thank you, Jeff, appreciate that. Any other comments there? All right, so it is 12 o'clock and um, there are a couple of announcements. There will, be, there will not be a mid-month meeting uh, in March, so the next board meeting is March 30th at 9 a.m. right here in Peacock Hall. And if there is nothing else, we are in recess to executive session. Thank you.